Ladies and gentlemen, it's Friday night, and we are here for episode seven of the Barroom Podcast. For seven straight weeks, we have all come here on time. At least most of us. Some of us are still trickling <laughs> in late, as usual. But uh, I just wanted to go ahead and give uh, everyone a roundabout because we have some familiar faces here, and we have a new face this week. So let's go ahead and give a shout out to the ones who are here, our regulars who are on time. Cassie Colt, Cassie the Cage. How you doing today? I'm chilling, bro. Just had a, a hamburger with a bunch of jalapeno peppers on it, and I feel it burning through my stomach. So hopefully, I don't die on the podcast. <laughs> And then coming from us all the way in the West Coast, uh, internet troubles and all, Mr. Rob Marta, how you doing today? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I got fired from my job today, so uh, it's been um, it's been yeah. fun. It's been a good yeah. Friday. <laughs> but uh, at least you could say it's a job that you probably were going to end up quitting anyway, so it yeah. could be yes. a lot worse. Congratulations, yeah. you've been set free. Now, you, now yeah. you can be on your merry way, fly to somewhere, maybe hopefully a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, you only you only feel bad when you get fired from a job you actually wanted, not a job that you were on yeah. the verge of quitting to begin with. So I'm sure you'll be all right, though, then. And then here we have our new lovely guest this week. Uh, so the last, I guess, two or three weeks now, we've been mentioning the name Sarah over and over again. And everyone's like, who the hell is Sarah? No one knows who this is <laughs> outside of Rob. So I think on the um, Blackfield stream we did on Wednesday, I actually called you Sarah Garrett. That is just the first name that was in my mind, but no, that's not your last name. It is Sarah Hargett who joined us for the first time, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing today, Sarah? Yeah, I'm good. I don't know anything about anything, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> nice. So I've, I've known Sarah for for a while. I've actually known Sarah a little bit longer than I've known Rob because we're obviously we've been in the uh, film critic uh, circle for quite some time. So we've been reviewing movies, we've been talking about films for a long, long time. And now that I finally have like a little YouTube and Twitch thing going, I was like, well, who better than talk about the world of entertainment than the person who actually reviews movies? But wouldn't you agree? No doubt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to go ahead and give everyone just a well shout out about Sarah finally joining us for the first time, as you can see from our banner below. So this is the world round debut of Miss Sarah Hager. I just want to go ahead and give a shout out to the chat real quick because our good friend Louis the Casual is here, and then he's here on time uh, this, yes. this week. So hopefully he won't be uh, 30 minutes uh, away from our conversation. But uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to disclose that information or not, but you know, we can. Yeah, I mean, it was basically a billing office for an ortho ortho uh, orthopedic surgeon, you know, medical office, and uh, you know, it was basically processing the payments and stuff, and but also like having to like the, be the only person in the billing department who calls people back to like who had questions about their bill. So basically, like I had so much so much of a workload that. It was like there's no possible way I'm gonna get this done, and it was like like under twenty bucks an hour, and with inflation, it's it's I almost have no money at the end of the month after bills yeah. are paid. So um, I just needed to find something else. Yeah, no, I feel like especially with like inflation skyrocketing right now, I mean, you gotta make it worth it at the end of the day. And some places yeah. are still like only charging like under like fifteen, seventeen dollars an hour, and expecting you to like work uh, health a lot more. So. You got to like pick your spots when it comes to that. So I don't blame yep. you at all. So Sarah, I know you haven't uh, the first time joining us for the podcast uh, this week. So normally what we do here is that, you know, we just talk about the news of the week, uh, the, the big stories in the world of uh, movies and television. Normally, uh, well, at least the last couple of weeks, we've been doing uh, movie reviews. I think we did the Beavis and Butthead two weeks ago. And then we uh, painstakingly did the, the Princess last week, which is a film that everyone here enjoyed and simply didn't regret uh, wasting 90 minutes of their life to go watch. But uh, we're actually just going to go straight with the reviews this week. And I got one. Since since you're on the show tonight, I think we can go ahead and start off with a story that you may know a little bit about. Uh, who here has seen uh, The Terminalist? No, sorry, The the, the Terminalist for uh, Chris Pratt's uh, is it, uh, Amazon Prime show, I believe it is? Mm -hmm. I I've seen three out. episodes. Yeah, I've only got a chance to see one episode because, you know, I do more movies than I do television. But from what I saw, the first episode was pretty good. But apparently there's people on, on the progressive left uh, side of the spectrum that are not big fans of this show. They, they pretty much come out and completely trash the show based on uh, its subject matter. They've trashed the star of the show, uh, Chris Pratt, because they just absolutely despise Chris Pratt for uh, very novel reasons. We even talked about this at the very end of, of the Black Bill stream, where there's, there's much more people in the MCU, um, personally, than, than Chris Pratt, but some of them, they just love to go with him. So let's go ahead and start with this story. This is a story uh, from Bounding in the Comics. 
uh, place that I've worked for for the last uh, few months. And it says the Terminalist author, uh, Jack Carr, this rates critics after they panned the Chris Pratt uh, action thriller. So those who haven't seen um, the show, essentially what it is, is a show about um, Pratt's character within the, the Marines. Uh, the very, like the first uh, 20 minutes of the show is them going uh, overseas. They're going for uh, they give a rescue mission, but uh, things go wrong. A lot of people die. And now he's essentially come a person out for a revenge. He's almost sort of like uh, the Punisher, but, you know, not more in line with, uh, I guess, modern times than the whole, you know, uh, Vietnam veteran angle that they went with before. So the story here is that, you know, critics have been trashing this show. Um, for a multitude of reasons. They complained about it being American exceptionalism. They complained about it being a white ring uh, uh, fantasy, a violent fantasy, and all these other things. But people who have actually watched the show says that it's very, very good. They like it a lot. So uh, Carr took to its official Twitter um, earlier this week and told uh, people straight up when they were comparing the audience score to the critic score for the show. Right now, the critic score at this uh, screenshot the, the, the critics gave it 38 uh, percent positive, while the fans gave it a 94 percent positive. And he made the statement that we did not make the terminal list for film critics; we made it for those in the arena. Enjoy the ride. Hashtag terminalist. So this whole thing kind of started when um, the Daily Beast, which I guess even uh, their review made it all the way to Tucker Carlson's show, which I didn't know about. But uh, mm -hmm. so essentially, what happened was that the Daily Beast, which is a far left publication, called it an unhinged right wing fantasy. Um, so said during the, the segment, uh, Carr says that it seems to have triggered quite a few of these critics. And so I have a couple of examples here. The Daily uh, Beast entitled their review, The Terminal List is an like unhinged right-wing fantasy, which is odd because right, left, conservative, liberal are not mentioned in the show at all. But I think it may be that the protagonist is uh, competent with weapons, tactics. He's strong and he holds those in power accountable. Carr continues that um, that could be unsettling for some, particularly some maybe senior members of the military who have failed upwards for the last 20 years. So even taking a shot at the, the people in the currently in service. It says that um, they go on to write here about some serious danger to the term of pandering to red state viewers with routine references to beer, guns, country music, and hunting cars. Said. The Daily Beast does not like those things. It sounds, it, it does not sound like it as much fun over there, he asserted. But 95% viewer rating, the audience's rating makes it all worth it. Carr reiterated that the original tweet saying that he didn't make it for uh, critics, he made it for those in the arena. We made it for the soldier, the sailor, the uh, airman, the marine that went to uh, the went to down the range in Iraq, Afghanistan. So they could sit on their couch and say, "Hey, these guys put in the work. They put in the effort to make something that looks special, and then make a show that speaks to uh, that speaks to them." The 95% uh, rating lets me know that we have gotten close. Um, let me go make sure that I didn't miss anything here. Yeah, so it's like Game Rant uh, was another outlet was complaining about uh, the don't tread on these flags as a narrative because they, they conflate that with white supremacy now, just like they conflate everything with white supremacy. Uh, there was a couple other um, outlets that that trash in the, the TV show. Like I said, it, it's a show that's about, you know, the military. It's a show that's about Chris Pratt. And, you know, people on the left don't like those things, so they just went ahead and trashed the show. But... People pretty much aren't listening to them. They're getting uh, great reviews from the people who have seen it. Like I said, I've only seen one episode thus far, and it looks pretty good to me. Now, Sarah, you've watched a few more episodes than I have. So uh, go ahead and just kind of give you what your feelings are of the show first, and then give your thoughts about how these uh, critics are going after the show for being a, a right-wing uh, nightmare fantasy, as they call it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm really enjoying it, actually. Um, and not just because Chris Pratt is in it, and I like Chris Pratt, but like, it's it's probably one of my favorite Amazon like in that vein like it's better than the Jack Ryan series in my opinion it's better than um, yeah. that other one with Michael B Jordan what was that called Oh I know what you're talking about Yeah uh, it's definitely yeah, better I, than I, that I know what you're talking about yeah. And um what was the more recent one there uh, I was Reacher? just thinking about this Yes Reacher it was I loved it way more I'm loving it I haven't finished it obviously but I'm liking it a lot more than Reacher right now. Reacher was boring for some reason. I did not like that. But yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I like the style. Um, like the the cerebral, like, you know, psychological kind of stuff that they show when he's like, because his memory and he's like the like the trippy scenes that happen and they yeah. are cool. 
And then Chris Pratt is like, you know, he's he's not a great actor, like acting, acting, but yeah, he's, yeah. he's a good, he's a movie star type, and like he's he's trying. So I'm enjoying him through that, and the plot is intriguing. Um, yeah. Uh, real quick, a lot of people, uh, I think John, when we were talking about this, or John from Bounding in the Comics, you talk about how it's very similar to like the Punisher. Did you ever get the, the feeling watching that that it had a lot of Punisher vibes to it? Yeah, it definitely has Punisher vibes. Also, that um, the Bruce Will these revenge. I don't know Punisher. Yeah, the, the Bruce Willis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot like that. But uh, the Punisher has like a, that Marvel vibe to it, even though it tries to be like gritty and realistic. And this has more like a, it's definitely not a Marvel vibe, that's for sure. Yeah, which is a good <laughs> thing. All things. Yeah, so. definitely. <laughs> Thanks. So, so, so what do what do you think of uh, essentially the, the critics trying to trying to trash it uh, the way they have versus what the way the audience is saying? It's like, hey, this is actually something that I can enjoy watching for. Uh, a couple of episodes, maybe a couple of seasons. Uh, what do you think is just the backlash behind it? Yeah, well, for critics now, if you're not explicitly leftist, then you're conservative. So this show being yeah. basically politically neutral and like not anti-American is just making it be bad for them. They just hate that. And also they hate Chris Pratt for some reason. I can't figure out why, but I love it because they just don't have any dirt on him at all. Like he's impossible yeah. to hate. Yet they still just, they want to hate him so bad and they're trying to find something and they just can't. It's hilarious. Yeah. They, 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 they hate him because, you know, he's Christian and I'm pretty sure he's conservative too. And then he's your typical uh, white male, which they also hate as well. So you add all those things in with the military and guns. And this is like, this is like a personal nightmare for them, but they portray it as if it's a nightmare for everybody else. And it's clearly not. Um, Cassie, let me ask you a question as someone who, who loves guns. There's a lot of guns uh, in this series, for the first uh, couple of episodes. So this is something that you'd probably be into. But what do you think about just the, the reaction? behind this series from progressive critics like the Daily Beast. Yeah, uh, I'm not at all surprised at this point when it comes to critical review, in at least mainstream-wise. They don't yeah. critically review the actual content presented. It's, they critically review the people behind it. Do they fall in line with their uh, leftist rhetoric or not? does the show itself actually fall in line with their leftist rhetoric like that's the only thing they're critically reviewing at this point and uh when i look at this and i see that the critic review is so low and i look at their bullshit excuses as to why and then i see that people that actually do watch and are reviewing the content itself presented in the show saying it's amazing well i want to go watch it now and i recently did get amazon uh Prime, so I'm definitely going to watch it because, well, the people that actually care about the content presented, the viewers themselves seem to love it. And hey, if they do a good job with it, I, I definitely want to check it out. And it's rare when I watch TV shows because it's like I have to, like, it's just too much time out of my day to go out of the way. I'd rather watch like a film that's two hours and it has a beginning and it has an end and it's in, within a reasonable amount of time. But I won't make time for this because. Apparently, it's something really good because all the people I think are, are complete losers uh, hate it. So I, I think that, that that's a good a good indication that it's pretty damn good. And uh, I don't I don't think Chris Pratt is necessarily like a great actor by any means. He he fits the bill of what a modern actor typically is, and they hate this dude for literally no reason at all. And it just makes me like him more. So. Congratulations. Yeah, you're, you're you're encouraging people to like someone that you hate by giving him this much attention. So hey. Uh, uh, Rob, I'm not sure if you're if you're more like me, if you're just more of like a movie guy than like a TV series guy, because at least if a movie's bad, it only takes up like 90 minutes to two hours out of your day versus like a series that can go on for like 13 episodes. And if that's just like one season of it, then you have to like commit a lot to it. Is this a show that you would look forward to at least watching a few episodes like for, or like what was kind of your general reaction towards the terminal list before? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to watch sitting down and watching it, um, just because I mean, I like, you know, I like vigilante stories and revenge stories, and you know, it seems uh, a lot of people think it's compelling. I, yeah, I mean, television is is um, 
you know, it's fine. I think the <laughs> idea that we're in some kind of golden age or some, you know, second golden age of TV is a little far fetched. But, um, you know, there, there are good shows out there. I just, I, there's so much to choose from. There's so many different streaming platforms and there's so many different, you know, um, offshoots of, you know, one show having, you know, an, an offshoot of another. And I, I you know, I, I'm, I haven't even touched Disney Plus stuff. I mean, so it's just, there's a lot that I'm really behind on, um, honestly. So it's, I mean, I'm still finishing up like Peaky Blinders, you know, like season, season four of Peaky Blinders, you know. So, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff, um, but I'll have to make some time to watch uh, this the show because i mean chris pratt is not i I think i've said it before he's not a great actor um but Mm -hmm. i think i like him a little bit better than chris hemsworth who really has never done much for me personally so um yeah yeah, i i'm looking forward to it um but yeah i'm generally a a movie guy yeah i mean it'll be fair to chris hemsworth he just hasn't really been in anything like noteworthy anyway like i said i think the only thing i've really liked him in as a sort of actor was that netflix movie he did a couple of years ago the extraction which i think they're doing a, um their sequel to that should be out later this year but uh where he went to i guess mumbai or like somewhere near uh, india and he was like trying to like, find the guy and bring him back and whatnot so it is kind of like a, a kind of a mercenary like military thing like as well but that was kind of the only thing where i saw like his real personality where he's not trying to be like this goofy like character that we see him in all the other movies like it's uh thor or ghostbusters or whether it's like men in black which is playing a complete goofball character it's like okay so you actually can do something a little bit more serious uh in terms of that goes but i mean for for me like i said the reason why i typically stay away from television at least i've had for a while is that you know you commit to a television show but the problem is that the writers these days are just not quality like whatsoever there's no more quality uh television writing uh, it feels like you just get like a, a smorgasbord of people who will just come together and write uh, a series of episodes. So you'll have like one guy will come in, I'll write the, the second and third episode, then you'll never see him again. Then you have a completely new group of people doing episodes five, six, and seven, and nothing feels uh, it feels like it's flowing whatsoever. The storyline doesn't make any sense because there's so many hands, you know, in, in the kitchen just trying to create something. And just to be honest, a lot of these writers are just awful. A lot of these writers are just totally bad, but it seems like this is a show that actually has like at least a what I would say. I think one of the big problems like a lot of shows is that they go on too long. They don't know how to end things. At least this show at least sort of has like a direction of where it wants to go. Just from the sense that I've gotten from the, from what I've seen, so and they have an idea, they have a structure, and then they're going with it. And they're going with it in spite of the critics. So. Uh, any any last minute uh, thoughts on this one before I go on to uh, another TV show that I had to rant on today? I'm not sure you guys heard about it, but uh, final thoughts on the terminal list and uh, the the whole situation here. Yeah, it's based on a book, right? That's how come. It's, yes, like, yes. It's got a good direction there. Yeah. yeah. Someone who's actually going to stay true to what was written and not just you know decide that we're going to redo uh, we're going to redo a work that was far superior like Amazon has decided to do with the uh, Lord of the Rings. So and that's going to be a rant for a completely different day. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about that a little bit later on. But I showed that. Do you want to rant on? I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. Have any of you guys seen or heard any of the clips from the new Netflix Resident Evil show yet? Has anyone else checked this one out? Oh, I avoid it like the plague. <laughs> okay, so we were actually having a, a pretty good laugh about this at uh, the founding guys, Josh and Spencer, uh, earlier. So apparently what happened was that we all knew that Netflix was coming out with this Resident Evil series where they were going to just race swap everyone for, for no reason whatsoever. So now Albert Wesker is like this bald beta black man who is getting like harassed by his two young daughters. And you, you, right up, this is episode one, like, by the way. So this is right out of the jump. So you're asking fans of the series who have already had to sit through Paul W.S. Anderson's horrible movies for the last 20 years to get on board with this crap. The dialogue is absolutely, like, awful, like, terrible dialogue. There's a thread going on on the social media right now that's been pretty much capping off all of the, the, the terrible um, dialogue within this film, which apparently is real. I thought it was a joke when I first saw it. I think even Josh did as well. But it's real. Let me see if I can pull it up here for a second. But while I'm talking about that, it's just like, yeah, it's absolutely awful. It's absolutely terrible. And then I went as far to um, figure out, okay, well, who's writing this show? Like, who, who's writing this show? Why is this show so awful? Why is this show so bad? Who's actually uh, a part of this? 
and come to find out that, oh, yeah, the showrunner is, um, well, let's just say she's exactly who you expect. Someone who went to USD and then transferred to Austin, Texas, and uses the term Latinx and has done work for, for, for uh, Planned Parenthood and <laughs> like literally checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. Uh, and she's the main showrunner of, of the series, by the way. She, she's the one that's basically in charge of all the episodes. So you just have to like sit there and like wonder who in the world thought this was going to be a good idea. I'm trying to find this thread real quick. So I want to go through a couple. Here we go. Let me pull this up here for a second. I want to make sure that I get all of it. Yeah, so people have been uh, sharing screenshots of like the actual like dialogue in the film. So, oh, oh one second. Wrong one. Rip. I know, right? Oh my god, I'm just I'm just sick of these same usual suspects that make all this crappy stuff and just pisses on everything that I enjoy. <laughs> yeah, it's so almost these are like, just like sport. real lines of dialogue in the film. I want Pornhub to shred your resume. These are all things that are actually said. Like so you see these like screenshots and you think, okay, well clearly someone's like making memes. <laughs> Like on, on the internet, this is not like real dialogue. No, this is real, genuine dialogue from this series. This stuff that was actually said. Uh, oh yeah, so I have to show you this one too. I mostly read Zootopia porn, so okay, that that that's great. That's great dialogue. I want to hear from a child talking about what type of porn they watch with their father. And then here, here's some other things uh, here. One question, one character asks, "Will it have? Will I have to quarantine?" And no one says, "No, it's not like COVID." <laughs> also, by the way, you have to remember that this is Albert Wesker of this series talking like this. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Characters talking about how much they love SpongeBob SquarePants. So many random references in, in the series. Uh, this character, another uh, one saying, just call me the master of unlocking, which I guess is supposed uh, to be a, a deep gosh. laughing uh, funny thing. <laughs> Uh, here's another one. Only people who believed them were conspiracy freaks. And then the character says, in 4chan virgins or both. So taking a shot at 4chan in a, uh, in a Resident Evil series because we have to for, for things of that Sorry. nature. Yeah, this was what Wesker's was supposed to look like in, in the series who just looks like Blade. Like an old he Blade. Does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. It's like with these comments, it's like you could tell that these people that write this shit are so self-obsessed with their own lives. It's like yeah. they have to talk about all like 4chan and all this shit. It's just like, bro, can, can you at least pretend to have an imagination when you're making this stuff? Because it's like everything in one way or another is either a self-insert or they have to make commentary on something they either support or hate. They can. They have zero imagination, and that is the main reason why they just belong in a dumpster. Yeah, it, it, maybe you wonder why people hate Netflix specifically because they're the main ones who just create absolute other garbage that nobody likes, and it, then they actually have the audacity to want to charge you more money to like watch this. So real quick, this is the um, the showrunner here. I believe I have her name. Josh was just picking up. I'll. Uh, bring up on Josh here and there in a second, but yeah. So this is the person who's in charge. Her name is Lindsay uh, Villarreal, and she's the one that's uh, in charge of the entire uh, Netflix uh, 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 Resident Evil series. So yeah, if you wonder why your show is terrible, then there's a face that, that you can blame right there. Yep. Uh, Josh, like you haven't. Yeah, exactly right. Josh is having some technical difficulties. He says that awkward moment when Jacob shared the pick and I didn't know if it was a mean or a legitimate writer. It was, in fact, a legitimate writer. So, yeah, Josh is pretty disappointed, too, because he's actually a big fan of the Resident Evil series. And, yeah, everything's gone to crap. So uh, what do you, uh, let me just go ahead and ask you guys, what do you think about these awful uh, Netflix adaptations? This hasn't been the first one. We, we just barely could recover from Cowboy Bebop, and then here we are with, like, another one. <laughs> <laughs> I would be that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start with uh, Sarah. We can, yeah. What do you think of just Netflix in general? Uh, fortunately, I haven't been bothering with Netflix for like the past year, so I'm just been mm -hmm. like, oh, look at them go! All those terrible shows that I can't watch, so I don't even have to think about it. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, lovely, right? 
Uh, Kathy, yeah, I, how, how I didn't do you even know it existed? So <laughs> that's why I think about it. <laughs> so Kathy, what do you think uh, watching Netflix butcher another one of your favorite series in front of your eyes? <laughs> uh, I dodge Netflix. I refuse. Right when, like I said, when the cuties thing happened, I unsubbed and haven't. I avoid everything Netflix. I don't really talk about it. Uh, or just to trash on them sometimes because uh, Cowboy Bebop is one of my favorite animes. And the fact that they bastardized that to hell uh, kind of pissed me off a little bit. But I feel as though it's like like a competition to see who can make the worst Resident Evil content that isn't yeah. a video game. Like, it, it's, it, it's a huge competition. Which Who can make the shittiest TV show or movie when it comes to Resident Evil and it's like it's sad because it's not really hard to make a good Resident Evil anything. It really yeah. isn't. It's simple. Like, and they refuse to actually use their brain. Just rub your two brain cells together and try and leave your personal beliefs behind. At least respect the property. Like, this is a long-standing video game franchise that, that is still extremely beloved to this day. And while some of the games themselves, you know, have been up and down, I mean, the one thing I can say about Resident Evil is that it does try to be creative. It does try to change and, and adapt and do different things in the video games. And that's inspirable despite being around for shit. Like, since I was, I think before I was even, no, like I was a baby. That's when Res the first Resident Evil came out, before I even could pick up a controller. So, yeah. like, for them to constantly try and change and adapt and be creative, for them to constantly shovel out garbage, uh, if it be a film or a TV show, it it's disrespectful to the fans. It's disrespectful to the fact Resident Evil has been able to stand the test of time by being creative. It's just, it it's just a waste and it could be so much better, but they choose to be garbage. Uh, shout out to Spencer, who's still recovering from the Modella virus, uh, doing well here in the chat. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys real quick before I go to Rob. Did any of you guys see the, the Resident Evil movies that came out last year? That um, what was it? The Welcome to Raccoon City with no. Okay, I so refused. My my friends one... watched it, and I listened to their reactions while watching it on a uh, some site. <laughs> So uh, that was the entertainment, listening to them clown the movie while I was playing video games and using my time way more wisely. <laughs> yeah. It's just so, Rob, is Netflix the reason why you hate television, or is it just one of the reasons that you hate <laughs> entertainment in general? <laughs> no, I mean, um, I, I mean, I think that, um, I don't know, I, I like a certain, you know, prestige um, TV quality that, it, like, I guess like, uh, like I guess I would call them auteurs for TV. You know, the executive producers that are showrunners that sort of like drive their shows. You know, whether it's um, David Milch with Deadwood, Matt Weiner with Mad Men, David Chase with The Sopranos, David Simon with The Wire. I think all these are all great shows because they have a singular vision of what those shows are, what they ha what they, you know, what the theme is, and and the characters that follow a certain arc and. Um, that's the kind of TV that I find satisfying and I can watch over and over and over again. Um, and you know, of course that, the, the, there's not very much of that. Um, and so I, Netflix is just, is mostly crap. Um, but I, I also think video games don't necessarily translate well as adaptations to either the small or big screen. Um, and this, I mean, really Resident Evil was inspired by like George Romero zombie movies, I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I, maybe I'm speaking out of turn because I don't know that for, for a fact, but like largely they seem like that. And um, I haven't watched the TV show, the, the Resident Evil TV show, but it seems like they're not appealing to fans, but they're trying to like create a new generation of people who care about like tokenism and, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Just, just representation and these things that ultimately don't matter. It, it panders to that sort of sensibility. And even those people, it's like, okay, we still want a good story. We still want to be engaged with the characters. And that doesn't seem to be happening here. Yeah, I actually want to jump in uh, TW on this one. So let's go ahead and say hi to our good friend, uh, TW, Booty Hunter. The hey, what's up? Is, I don't know if you forget how you're doing here. 
It's good, hey. bro. Hey, hey, you, 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 same old, same old. You didn't hit us with the intro. We were back in the Cassie was waiting. Oh, yeah, on no problem. Yeah. What is up, guys? Keep up, booty hunter here. Yeah, there you go. There so I, I wanted to jump you in real quick just to talk about this before we move on to our next subject. Have you heard about the, the Netflix uh, adaption of the Resident Evil, the Resident Evil Netflix series that everyone's been talking about all day? Have you heard anything about this going on? Nah, no, not at all, man. So essentially what we were saying earlier is that, you know, the, the, the show looks awful. The dialogue is getting, like, torn apart on Twitter. Like, people are, like, really, like, trashing the dialogue of the show. It seems like a lot of the casting choices are just done for diversity and inclusion purposes. The show is absolute dumpster fire. I don't know you played the, the Resident Evil games before. Why does it just oh. seem like they just cannot get the, the Resident Evil series right, whether it's through the movies or through television? Like they, they seem to do at least pretty somewhat decent with the video games, but when it comes to actually bringing this up to a big screen or a small screen, they absolutely just drop the ball every single time. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, every time, honestly, the Resident Evil movies, I don't think I've seen a good Resident Evil movie ever. Uh, in terms of the yeah. Resident Evil games, you know, I played a little bit back in the day on the PlayStation 1, and I played, like, the remaster. But, yeah. Those games are okay, yeah. for the most part. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely bad. I think Rob just mentioned the Resident Evil uh, 2 trailer. I think he's talking about the game and not the the movie, right? Because the movie was uh, not good for, for those who have seen the Resident Evil. Oh, no, movie. not at all. Yeah, but I mean, uh, just to just quickly wrap this one up, like it's, uh, Rob said earlier, it's like they're not making these series for fans of this franchise. Nope. I mean, you, I can show you a couple other pictures of some of the writers that are in charge of this movie. None of these people, like they've ever seen or even played Resident Evil in their lives before. So I don't expect people like them to really honor the Resident Evil lore in any kind of way, shape, or form anyway, which tells me that you're not hiring the right people to, to begin with. You're hiring all the wrong people. We're going to make it even a terrible show that everyone who actually knows about uh, this is just going to complain about. And this is just a circle of Hollywood right now. You, know, you wonder why all your shows and all your movies are just bad. The first place that I always go to is like, okay, who wrote this? Who directed yeah, exactly. this? When you see the writer... And you see what the writers look like, and you see what the directors look like. It, the, the, it becomes immediately clear why your show sucks, and this show is absolutely no uh, different here. So, yeah. uh, any other uh, last thoughts on this one before we move on? Nah. It's, for me, it's oh, sad better. because it's like if they're gonna make stuff like this, and it's gonna be a dumpster fire anyway. Why not just make a Resident Evil TV show or a movie that does follow? The, the games, even if the games don't translate well. I mean, I think it's better to do that and, and it not be good than to make something that, that's for nobody. This is, this is they making things for people that don't exist. Nobody wants to watch this stuff. Not the crowds that you support, not, not any of these people, not the fans that actually, why don't you just make something that's at least for a certain demographic so at least someone can get this stuff, not imaginary people that don't exist. Yeah, you said it perfectly. Uh, Spencer said he hated the second Resident Evil movie. I think out of all of them, I think I hated the third one the worst. Like the third one w was pretty bad, and then obviously, if you guys are fans of Red Letter Media, you remember I think it was like the fourth one or the fifth one that they tried in 3D, where they had the mm -hmm. the guy that was doing like the very very bad CGI uh, stunt work for the, the fight teams when he's playing Wesker. So yeah. It's just a bad look, like all around the board for this I, one. I saw them. I saw, I think, the first one in the theater, and I think I might have seen the second one in the theater. And yeah, yeah. I mean, they were just like, I mean, really garbage movies then. I mean, and they got yeah. kind of, they tried getting bigger, but they just, there was not enough to hold them together. I mean, nope. you know, as just kind of those, those popcorn movies, though, they were, I mean, they were all right, but yeah, it's just not very good. <laughs> They yeah. put me to sleep. I, I, think I remember only watching them at my friend's house. I literally fell asleep throughout two of them. <laughs> I think it's like the yeah. first one is like the only one I can go back and say, okay, it, it's all right. Like it, it's not a good movie, but you know, it wasn't nearly as bad as like the seven or eight movies that came out like after it. Okay? <laughs> especially especially the, yeah. that last one they did where they put like it was almost like a young adult adaption of like Resident Evil where they hired some the kid from like victorious to be uh leon and leon was a total buffoon now the entire movie and then they, they put the girl from skins like kaya scardelia whatever her name is 
she uh she's Claire, and then she's like obviously the strongest one the entire one because you know girl power and stuff like that. And I'm just thinking to myself like who who like who is this for? And then somehow when they create a movie or a TV show. They put out another one like months later that's even worse than the one they just did. So now I'm like looking back at that awful movie from like six months ago. And I'm thinking, wow, like this is actually like uh, the bold and the beautiful compared to whatever shit you guys do on Netflix right now. So it, it, it's bad all across the board. So Netflix sucks. You don't spend 20 bucks a month. You're just wasting your money at this point. So here, here's a quick question. Who here has uh, been on? I think I actually lost Rob for a second. Bring Keegan back in. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering why there there was two Robs uh, instead of one. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Um, and so, who here has been to Comic Con? Who here has been to any kind of uh, convention? No one. Uh, oh wait, 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 wait. Never so never I went to Oda. I went to Otakon way back in like 2005, uh, which is an anime convention in Baltimore that they. I don't know if they see, still even hold it, but yeah, my brothers. Yeah, so. They, they're into that. Uh, I wonder. I, I wonder if Spencer is gone. I have to believe Spencer has gone to at least one of them. If that's I'm <laughs> you know, but, uh, obviously, I'm from San Diego, so I've been to a few comic cons. I actually been to a few uh, Wonder Cons in Anaheim as well, which is run by the same company. If if you had the choice between the two, I would prefer the Anaheim one. It's far better than the San Diego one. But so, uh, if you've been to Comic Con uh, before, I can tell you this: it's fun the first time you go. But then yeah. the novelty wears off very, very quickly. I mean, you yeah. go there, there's 200,000 people crammed in downtown San Diego every single year. Yeah. It's not a, a huge space. It's a very, very small space. So you're going to be walking around a lot. You're going to be walking around endlessly over and over again. Then you have to, like, camp out outside just so you can go inside the Hall H and watch a two-minute trailer of, like, an Avengers movie that they're going to put on YouTube, like, five minutes after it premieres afterwards. So it just makes everything seem stupid. To, to begin with, so yeah, it Spencer says here that he went to Comic Con every year from ninety seven two thousand thirteen. So he actually went. Um, wow. He's actually like way back in the day. He's been gone that long. My first one was probably I think two thousand thirteen. I went between two thousand thirteen and two thousand eighteen around that point. And then I just started getting like tired of it. So, but this year, if you want to go to Comic Con, you're going to have to pay a price, and the price is your soul because this year's Comic Con, they are enforcing vaccine passports. For all attendees. So, a quick little sidebar here. If you don't know how Comic Con works, because there's such a high demand for for this event, and there's not a whole lot of tickets to be sold, they essentially sell their tickets in a lottery system. So, the way they usually do it over the last few years is that you have to wait like months before the event takes place. You have to get a, a link from the organizers. Then you have to like wait in the online waiting list for what could be up to an hour, maybe two hours. But as it's gotten more popular, the time is shortening out. And you have to be literally in the online uh, waiting list to see if you can get in and buy tickets. And you can't refresh the page once you're in there. If you refresh the page, you automatically go to the back of the line, which pretty much means you won't be going. So this is the way that things people have been doing this for the last few years. So when you get there, you, you set all your plans. Good luck finding a fucking hotel in San Diego downtown <laughs> during that weekend because they all sell out. And even the ones that are not close to downtown will upcharge you 500 bucks a night just so you can stay there. There's a big F you all around the world. So imagine going through all that, going through the plans. You've already planned out your hotel, your tickets, and all that good stuff. And then they hit you a couple of weeks before the event by saying, hey, by the way, you have to get the vaccine or else you can't go. Or you have to get a negative test within 72 hours or else you can't go. So this was a story out of uh, Comic-Con uh, here that they're enforcing a vaccine passport. And we all know what vaccine passports are. There's little passes that say that unless you're quote unquote fully vaccinated, which means you've gotten your both shots and all the other boosters that came along with it, you won't be allowed to go. Uh, if you're not vaccinated, your only out is that you have to get a certified COVID test within 72 hours of the scheduled event. And the reason why I say the scheduled event is because the event itself, Comic-Con, is about a four to five day event, which means that if you have an all week pass, you will have to get essentially two COVID tests in the course of one week or else your other one is going to expire if you're unvaccinated, which is another thing they try to, uh, I guess, entice you to actually get the vaccine. So they're enforcing that throughout all the events. They'll have six centers where you'll have to check in to get your vaccination uh, wristband that proves that you were already checked in previously. Cosplayers are not exempt from these rules. All cosplayers 
have to wear face masks regardless of their vaccination status. But even if you are fully vaccinated and got all the boosters, you still have to wear a mask. All children <laughs> who are five and older are required, required to wear a mask. So if you're there with all of your kids, all of your kids have to be masked up at all times or risk being tossed from the event. Uh, I talked about how you have to have your wristbands. So uh, David Glazer, who is the um, event spokesperson for Comic-Con, said that, you know, they, they talked about a series of things because I guess COVID cases are going back up in Southern California right now. So he said the main thing that we discussed is that everyone uh, with everybody that we're going to continue the mask mandate. With things being so much in plus, we thought that it was pretend to be safer rather than not. So two and a half years into this thing, and we still believe that masks are going to protect you from the respiratory virus. So he also goes on to says that, uh, so the primary discussions uh, with all of our stakeholders some entities had no travel restrictions. He's talking about other um, events that they've done that didn't have any restrictions. They said, so we understood that there were some groups that may not be able to attend, but obviously there's no shame in that. The decision to attend Comic-Con has to be a personal one. We're grateful to the groups that are coming down. We totally understand those that might not feel comfortable with doing so. We will let everyone uh, know that. So um, it goes on to say that you know Comic-Con's policies, all these rules are exempt to exhibitors, guests, staff, uh, press, professionals, cosplayers. So if you're there selling stuff at the event, if you're there uh, volunteering, if you're cosplaying, if you're there as a press, or if you're just walking around, you all have to wear a mask. Then, of course, he says that, well, celebrity guests may not have to wear them. They may get exceptions. But there are going to be case-on-case exceptions made for celebrities who are on stage during the panel. So depending this on is the a big we have- middle finger. This is a big middle finger to fans. And to anybody mm-hmm. that that patrons this thing, because it's like, but once again, you peons have to wear masks. By the way, they don't have to be, you know, N95s. They don't have to be things yep. that actually have shown some protection. It, it's it's just you have to wear a mask. You have to adhere to what we say. You have to do, you know, basically, we, you yeah. have to do what we say. Yep. So right here, he says that if the stage is in access of six feet from the audience and those members on the panel, we have uh, heard that a lot of members of the panel's traveling have been in bubbles and their uh, verification of vaccine status or negative tests. So those panels probably may not have to follow the rules. So what he's essentially saying is that, well, you know, the the studios, uh, they've been social distancing within the studios and some of those people have vaccination cards or negative status so those celebrities won't be here to the same rules that all the other peasants who are going to be here for the next week <laughs> are going to be around for it says it says but other pilot panels may not be which means that if you're if you're not the rock who's going to be taking over hall h this uh c- coming saturday then you, you're pretty much going to have to wear the mask the rock isn't going to wear the mask he's not going to sit there like a spoon for an hour and, and talk through a mask but all the other people will the comic-con is going to partner with the service clear health pass which is the vaccine passport program on your phone to show that you have gotten the proper shots and you've gotten a negative COVID test within 72 hours. This is the same uh, app that they used in New York City when New York City implemented the first major uh, vaccine passport to enter hotels, gyms, movie theaters, restaurants, and sporting events. So they're parting up with those people. And then, as I said earlier, because this is a potentially five-day event, if you're there for the whole week, if you're not there for just one day, wherever the case may be, you're going to have to get two negative uh, tests in the course of yeah. one week. <laughs> Such bullshit. The full event. That's if you're unvaccinated. So, and so this, those are the rules for, for Comic-Con. So uh, obviously, you know, you guys have been to Comic-Con. I know uh, Rob has given his uh, displeasure about it. So I want to start off with Sarah and kind of go around the horn. What do you think about Comic-Con's rules saying uh, put the mask on, get the shots, or don't show up, even though he already paid the money uh, to be there? Ugh. It makes me so mad. This stuff, mm-hmm. ugh. It, it just like no, <laughs> the not. vaccine doesn't even work. So they're gonna be like, you have to get a vaccine, and you or or ugh. and then the they're probably gonna have a super spreader event anyway. Even because yeah. no one's gonna wear a good mask, and that's everyone's gonna be getting it. Yeah. But it, it, I, they, just, and they, yeah. you said that they um. Like they sold the tickets already, and then they told them that they had to get a vaccine. Yeah. So, um, like I said, this is what they've done. If you have to get, uh, yeah, if you have to go to like Comic Con, you have to buy those um, passes like months in advance. So these probably, people probably bought their passes maybe about six months before this event actually took place. 
So that's usually yeah. around the time they sell them. And now, like, two weeks beforehand, it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you have to get the shot. And, and they didn't you. have any, like, rules while they were selling tickets, of course, right? And so yeah, no. Assume that you're you, that you're good. And now you have your costume all planned, and they have to wear a mask and ruin it. Great. Yeah. But well, remember, the, the Oakland Raiders uh, did this last year, too, because remember – 2021, they didn't allow any fans into the, the stadium whatsoever. They, they went the entire season with no fans. So last year was supposed to be their first season in Las Vegas where fans actually got to attend. They allowed people to buy season tickets for the for the, all the games and then even let people go to the first preseason game of the season. And after the second preseason game, they said, hey, by the way, you have to get the vaccine in order to come to the game. And they didn't give you an option of, well, if you get a negative test in 72 hours, you can still go. They said, no, if you're not vaccinated, you can't come to any of the games. So a lot of people were forced to sell their season tickets that they had already paid for because the, the, the team and the governor said that you're not allowed to go to a game if you're not fully back. So and it was well, another thing, we all know that the – I'll just go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, was, another thing we know is that, the, <laughs> that, that the, the definition of fully vaccinated just keeps on changing over and over again. Yeah. So in order to be fully vaccinated, you have to get all the 1,700 boosters it takes for you to actually you know, protect yourself from the virus and then get it anyway. Yeah. So stupid. I just hope that everyone else gets as uh, annoyed about it as we are. And then maybe the Comic-Con will lose money next year or something. They'll learn their lessons somehow. Yeah, yeah you wonder uh, when people really are going to have right enough now. of this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When are people going to be fed up and just be like, no, no one's show up at the Comic Con anymore? When? Yeah. Come on, guys. It's up to you. I don't know. You know, those those nerds are a different breed. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, some of them are probably going to be wearing masks and be fully vaxxed anyway, right? Yeah, I can't wait to see the Wolverine cosplayer wearing a mask. No one knows like a cheap imitation ones because he has no choice. Uh, Cassie, what do you think about this whole thing? Like, imagine if you had bought a uh, ticket to the event and they told you a week beforehand, oh, by the way, get them back, you can't come in. Yeah, I obviously would be pissed. My my thing is, uh, if you're so concerned about covid why aren't you telling the people that are vax to go get their test too? Because they're ca they can be carriers just as much as anyone else. Exactly. That's yeah. what pisses me off about this. It's like... If everyone, like, the thing is, you're clearly showing favoritism in regards to that. Oh, well, if you got the jab, you can just go right ahead. And it's like, well, they're carriers. I mean, if, if it was a thing, it's like, look, if you're going to set, like, this standard, then set it for everyone instead of just fucking playing favoritism. That That's my biggest problem with, with this scenario because... I think that's garbage, but the fact that they're doing this to begin with, even two years afterwards, almost three now, it, it's a joke, man. Like, get the fuck over it. You know, I got I got the COVIDs, and I was sick, and whatever. Like, I got over it. You know, like, at this point, we have to accept the reality. It's not going away. It's going to be a thing, and if you're going to force people to wear face diapers for the rest of their life, I mean look, you just look like, I just laugh at you. Like, you're a joke. And I won't, I will not participate in any of this shit because at the end of the day, I don't need it. I don't need, uh, the thing is, look, man, people have to accept that if you continue to go along with this shit when it comes to entertainment and you have an addiction problem, you don't need Comic-Con. You don't need these superhero movies. You don't need this shit. It's just, it, it is a piece of entertainment. It isn't water. It isn't food. It is not a necessity at all. You know, have some fucking balls and actually have some standards. You know, stop <laughs> acting like this. It's an addiction. And people need to get over this and accept that they have an addiction problem and do something about it. Because they really don't think that they do. They think it's completely normal to go insane because I, I want to see the next Iron Man. I want to see the next Spider Man. It's, it's not a necessity. Calm the fuck down. People were just like telling me, oh, you got to see this next Spider-Man movie. It's so fucking good. I'm like, no, I don't have to see it. It's not food. It's not water. I'm not starving. Disney is not a necessity. Fucking control yourselves. <laughs> now, like, just get over it. You know, don't, don't participate in this shit. You don't need it. Do something better and more productive with your time. I think even just sitting on your ass and, and eating... Uh, freaking hamburgers in your in your house while you're watching anything else is better than wasting your time literally 
giving your money to this stuff, giving your money to these people. These people are, mm-hmm. to me, they're fucking evil. And I'm just over them already. Like, I'm just sick and tired of their shit. I wish everyone would just be sick and tired with me so that this shit would stop. Well, tell, tell us how you really feel now. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> but I mean, look, look, like I said, I, I've been to these events many, many times, especially in San Diego. Like, these are people who will literally camp out on the side of the convention center in downtown San Diego. Or if you haven't been to San Diego, especially the downtown area, there's a lot of dangerous homeless people out there, too. So you're literally risking uh, your, your safety as well uh, going out there. Hold on a second. You guys can hear me, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. But uh, yeah. what I'm saying is that you have a lot of these people out there who will sit there uh, for a weekend because they think that, oh, well, I'm going to get in the whole H and sit in the 15th row, and then The Rock is going to come out and talk to the crowd for two minutes, and then we're going to watch uh, a one-minute uh, exclusive uh, footage of a Black Adam movie that's going to be out in theaters like three weeks later. It's like, what are you guys yeah. doing? It's uh, like, what are you guys doing? I, I still uh, can't, Keith, like, I can't imagine still being like crazy about celebrities. Like, these people are all insufferable. I can't imagine yeah. really trying to go out of my way. Oh, my God, I got to see Dwayne Rock Johnson talk about this <laughs> shitty movie that's going to suck anyway. Fuck out of here, man. I mean, I'm obsessed with celebrities, but it's more like Robert Mitchum and Dana Andrews. You and know who I'm Bert obsessed Lancaster. with? People that are gay. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Celebrities <laughs> that are gay. At this point, almost I refuse. <laughs> At this point, I refuse to endorse a celebrity up until they die because who knows what dumb shit is going to come out of their mouth these days. That is a prerequisite. Unfortunately, you know, not wishing bad on anybody, you must be dead for me to endorse you. There you go. <laughs> these people are just people to me. That's what I mean, these celebrities, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah. But then again, I came from LA, so it's whatever. Well, hold on a second. You came from LA, so you, you never once uh, uh, thought of going to Comic Con and basically walking around for hours upon hours. Comic Con? Hell, that's <laughs> fuck, no. That's way out of my league, bro. I don't go to those things. <laughs> no. Hey, man. So, so, what you're saying is that there's no event out there that you would go to that told you, hey, you have to get double vax in order to attend, or else you can't go? No way, man. I'm mm-hmm. cool with that. Yeah. Well, like Kathy was saying earlier, it's like it's pretty obvious that they're just doing this as a way to entice people to get the facts because we still have to get everyone vaccinated because all of our shows are brought to you by Pfizer. So everyone has to get the shot no matter how many times you get it. Because the whole and people like to say that, oh, well, we never said that uh, vaccine uh, stopped the spread of COVID. It's like, yeah, you did. Because the reason why you started this program, because you believe that if people got the vaccine, they wouldn't get COVID to spread COVID anymore. So if everyone was backed up in one small little area, we know that we're not spreading COVID. And now we're finding out that pretty much everyone who's gotten the vaccine has gotten COVID and spread COVID to other people. So you're not even actually protecting anyone by doing this. You're essentially trying to chill out for that that little squeeze of the orange that's left for our Pfizer to get a couple more billions of dollars because the entire planet is forced to take their vaccine uh, against their will. Uh, Rob, I'll let you go ahead and get your final thoughts on this one. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a uh, convention, I, I want to say six to eight weeks ago, and I think it was uh, it was TCM, and and it was just like this opportunity to kind of like rub elbows with like famous people and whatever, but it was also just yeah. uh, like classic movies on the big screen at this you know at this location with like a, many different theaters and. Um, that was a really cool idea, but I found out you had to, ha- you know, you had to be vaccinated and, and be up to date on your boosters. And look, I lost my job with the state government here in Washington state, uh, because I wouldn't get vaccinated. Um, it, I, I've sort of refused it and I, just today. I saw somebody, you know, heading to the fair with a, with a, you know, cloth mask over their face as they're running an 80 degree weather. And so I'm just like, I don't understand it. I don't understand people's belief in a piece of cloth stopping anything i think it's just like you take your risk in life and hey if you get sick take care of yourself but um i'm really deeply skeptical about how even effective this thing is so um i don't know like i think it's a slap in the face to the fans i think it's a slap in the face to anybody that like it spends money um on these properties, you know, and so it's just a it's just a big whiff of classism. 
By the way, I know Spencer's in the chat. Uh, vitamin D. A lot of people are saying if you want to slowly get better, just take a lot of vitamin D for, for the next few days, and it should help you out a lot. That's what I ended up taking when I got sick uh, earlier this year. It was just vitamin D and a little bit of fish oil, so you, know, you combine that one for a bit. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, obviously these, these mega corporations and all these big companies are all trying to force people to get the vaccine. And I just tell you this, just wait it out. Like even the people like last year, we all know when they were trying to be like, well, if you don't want your job, then you know you got you got to take the vaccine or you're gonna lose your job. And obviously, Rob is one of the people who lost his job because he refused to get vaccinated. Well, guess what? There's also a lot of people right now who are going to lose their job in the next couple of months because the economy has gone to shit. So imagine being that person who didn't want to get the vaccine and got the vaccine because you wanted to keep your job to protect you know, your family, whatever the case may be, and then you get laid off a few months later after that. It's just a, a double F you on top of that. Like when we were talking about the Raiders uh, earlier. It's like, yeah, imagine you say, oh, I want to go get the shot just so I can go watch a football game. It's like, dude, just wait it out because they already made the announcement that this year that, hey, guess what? You don't have to um, you don't have to get vaccinated to go to the game now. So if you had just had a little bit of patience and, you know, kept kept your uh, addictions in check for a year, you would have been fine anyway. So I went to the. I went to the Seahawks home opener last year, right? And I had to get a negative test. I had to do the whole 70. And then, like, when I went, they barely looked at it. They barely checked it. And they did the whole thing where they charged people the season ticket price. They sold the tickets. And right after – actually, not even. It wasn't – they played their first game on the road. It wasn't a week until their home opener. And they were like, oh, yeah, you have to be vaccinated or show a negative test. And so it's like – I, I and I had to do that. I was like, I'm not getting a shot to go to the game if I can't go to the game. But luckily, they didn't have a policy like the Raiders. But um, mm-hmm. you know, I I was able to show the negative test and go. But it was like even when we went, it was like they didn't care, and so it was just almost like a, a tactic to get people to take a shot. Yep, and I, like I said, um, yeah, they do that for a reason. The why they wait for you to uh, purchase your tickets ahead of time and then hit you with that little caveat because they think that oh, well, this person, it'll be more convenient for them to simply get the shots and get a refund. And then they're surprised how many people will actually just say, no, just give me the refund. If I can't go, then I'm just not going to go. So, Some people are actually smart. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, you know, time tells all. Uh, I think Josh is uh, ready to, to join us again. I know he was having some issues. Are you there, Josh? Or Turn on your take mic. that as a no. Turn I don't even think he mic. has a mic or it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we'll let uh, Josh straighten his uh, mechanical issues out before we get in there. So, uh, any, any final words on this one before we move on to the next one? Get over no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> don't go to Comic Con. Don't go to Comic Con. Yeah, Stay home. I just wanted don't. to go to Comic Con when I was like 15. Now yeah. I just yeah. don't want to be around people. Just stay <laughs> away from me. Well, yeah. Like I said, someone who's been there quite a few times. Yeah, you, the first time you go, it's yeah, great. Yeah, I made it to the floor. I get to see like all things, take all the pictures. When you go next year, it's like, oh, it's the exact same setup as last year. Okay. And then when you go again, it's like, you know what? This isn't even worth it because now I have to like find parking in downtown San Diego, which is a pain in the ass on any other day rather than a day when there's not 200,000 people also down here as well. And you best believe they're charging you like 150 bucks, 150, 200 bucks for parking in downtown. We it for a couple of hours to how many people are down there. So, yeah, it, it, it's not worth it. Like I said, if you want to go yeah. to a smaller one, WonderCon is a lot more, less of a headache. It's basically the same thing anyway. Like, you won't see The Rock, but they'll, they'll, they'll show out some movies out there. There'll be some Warner Brother horror movie that, that James Wan will, will show for you. So, yeah, it, it's not worth it at the end of the day. Yeah, I couldn't, I, I couldn't do those type of convention things anyways. My sister goes to the anime conventions a lot, but, I mean, I don't, I don't participate in none of that stuff. Yeah. Oh, like I said, if, if you hate people, if you're like claustrophobic, probably not the best um, place for you to go either. So we did talk about football a little bit there. I was talking about the Raiders, so I guess we should keep oh. with football and talk about mm-hmm. arguably the greatest football player who has ever lived, Thomas Brady. And Tom Brady uh, had a little interview earlier this week where he sort of distanced himself from an old friend of his. That friend happens to be Donald Trump. <laughs> so. Uh, Brady, as uh, you know, is though, obviously one of the greatest football players ever, if not the greatest football ever. The dude had seven championships in like 20 years. Uh, the guy just won't lose. He won't go away. He's back. He's like 45 years old. He's still like the second-best quarterback in the league. It makes no sense. 
Uh, it's very easy to be jealous of, of Tom Brady, given all the success that he's had in his life. Uh, so he came out uh, earlier today because there's a deal going on with uh, Fox where he's going to be an analyst for Fox uh, Sports after he retires from the league, which we don't know if this is going to be his last season for real. He did retire at the end of this season and then came back a month later, so he's coming back for at least one more year. And he did an interview tour where he basically had to distance himself for former President Donald Trump because – uh, a few years ago, there was a picture of uh, Brady when he was with the New England Patriots, and he had a Make America Great Again hat and locker. And since then, he hasn't talked about politics in any way, shape, or form. So everyone has just assumed that he's a Trump supporter. And a lot of people in the media have hated on, on Tom Brady because they think that he supports Trump. He hasn't come out to say that he supported him or deny he supported him. So now he's finally talking about it here. And in an interview with Variety, um, he talked about that he hasn't spoken to Trump in a lot of years, blasting the media, pushing a fake narrative against him. And what Brady said is that I think the press has just mischaracterized a lot, Brady said, um, for attacking Trump, for insulting people. He says, my personality isn't one to insult anyone. I have plenty of my own flaws. I'm not here to point out somebody else. Now, uh, Brady also says that uh, he sort of admired Trump. And that was about 17, 18 years ago because Trump invited him to his private golf course. He said, I was so young, I got to go to a private golf course, and I thought it would be the coolest thing in the world, he exclaimed, uh, saying that he was about 26 when this happened. So this was like a long time ago. He said he went on to about, I'm oh, sorry, he went on to hint about um, how he doesn't agree with Trump's politics. He says that there's things that I agree with, there's things that I don't agree with, and there are things that uh, my wife, uh, the things I agree about my wife about, things I don't agree with. I love her to death. We don't always see eye to eye. I don't see eye to eye with anyone. I'm not responsible for what other people say. I'm only responsible for what I say, Brady added. He continued by saying, so if people want to say things that uh, that I've said or I'm about, that's up to them. I'm not going to respond to all those things all the time either. Now, um, when asked about the, the picture where he has to make America great again uh, hat in his locker, um, Brady went and told him, he says, Trump has always been a friend of mine, even though he just tried to say that he hasn't really talked to him in a number of years. He says the following year, he told the, the media that he calls uh, Trump on the phone, is that he didn't understand the media's exception, uh, obsession with it. So I always try to keep contact because for 16 years now, there may be someone, uh, the, you know, someone before, maybe in the position that he was in. I've been very supportive. He's been very supportive of me for a long time. It's just a friendship. I have a lot of friends. I call a lot of people on the phone, Brady says. He says, but since those days, Brady has uh, not only done an about face on Trump, he's also uh, mocked Trump voters, suddenly fans of his own. Last year, when um, the, the Buccaneers won the Super Bowl, um, they went to the White House. And that was the first uh, time that Joe Biden had a team to the White House. And he kind of took a shot at the fact that people were saying that the election was rigged, the election was stolen. He says that uh, I think 40% of people still don't think that we won the game. And then Biden all the commented, I understand that, making a joke about, you know, the, the totally uh, legitimate election where Biden got 81%, 81 million votes and the most secure election of all time. And if you don't believe that, you probably gonna get thrown off of YouTube. But I suggest you do believe that. Uh, just throwing that out there. So uh, essentially what's happening here is that uh, Brady's getting ready to transition into being a member of the media. He's essentially trying to uh, put out the flames about uh, any kind of connection to Donald Trump before people start holding against him or they try to cancel him, wherever the case may be, things of that nature. So he's, he's trying to get ahead and try to be like, well, you know, Trump was never my friend. Uh, if you guys are uh, fans of like MMA, there's an old quote of uh, Dana White saying that Conor McGregor was never his friend, even though he clearly lived very, very close for a number of years. So it's a little uh, in joke there. But Essentially, Brady's trying to do the same things. I'm like, oh, Trump, yeah, we were kind of friends, but we kind of weren't. And then, you know, we were we were sort of kind of, you know, I call him on the phone, but, you know, I call a lot of people on the phone, so they like, don't kill me. So, Rob, you're the uh, football guy here. You're the Tennessee yeah. Titans fan. I don't know why, but you are. So, uh, go, go, what do you think about this whole thing with, with Brady essentially trying to say, hey, stop saying I'm a Trump supporter, even though I had his hat in my locker in 2016 when he were ever president? Yeah, I mean, I think that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I mean, I think that they probably were more friends than he's letting on here. Uh, they were yeah. in maybe maybe more regular contact. But I also think that just like Tom Brady is somebody that kind of just like keeps everybody at arm's length for the most part and focuses on his craft of being an NFL quarterback. 
you know, and yeah, he is transitioning to the media. He gets signed a huge contract, I think with Fox sports. I'm not, I'm, I think it was with Fox, but yeah, um, it's, and it was, it's, it's for a broadcast contract. It's huge. Um, so I, I believe, yeah, I believe that to some degree he's trying to distance himself just so he doesn't have to sort of answer that criticism, especially if something ends up happening with the January 6th try. I, I personally don't think anything will end up happening with that. Yeah. Uh, but I think he's just hedging his bets and playing it safe. I agree. Um, I'll go on here because Josh says that he's ready now. So we're going to give Josh a shot. Josh, are you there? Yep, I'm here, mate. What's going okay. on? <laughs> and I see he has his football shirt, not football shirt. Right, we're calling right it football over here, man. Yeah, okay. stop saying soccer. soccer. But it, 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 here's soccer. The, what there's two reasons why I'm actually wearing the shirt, right? I'm not going to derail the topic for a minute. Um, one of them is because I'm now writing it for Bounding into Sports, which you should all check out, there we go. by the way. It's a really good website. So, And I'm writing now, so it's gotten better, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it, it was I better hope. when I was writing there, but whatever you say. When you were writing, did you leave? No, I'm still writing there. Oh, yes. Okay, don't... Come on, huh, be, be honest for a second, all right? You know you're a Samsung fanboy, and that's why you're wearing that shirt. That's all it boils down to. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, look, TV, Samsung over there. By the way, Resident Evil, proper Resident Evil, not the yeah. crap Matrix yeah. is, yeah, is dishing out at the moment. I respect yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, this is a, yeah, all right. So, yes, I'm a Samsung fan. I don't I don't know. Look, this came – look, the, the football team actually came with the Samsung support, so I don't know. <laughs> I suppose I support Chelsea now. <laughs> um yes hello um by the way i don't know anything about tom brady but i think like, I just, like it made, made the comment just seconds ago uh that ricky gervais actually is a friend of donald trump right and he doesn't mm -hmm. let the politics get in between that so i'm like yeah well maybe tom brady was not really you know good friends with donald trump so he's like eh, all right i'm just gonna distance myself uh, is yeah. is well, Donald Trump on. really friends with anybody? I mean, Donald <laughs> Trump, in terms of relationships, is very like it's very surface based. You know what I mean? It's very like oh, yeah. just I, it, hey, yes. anybody that that stokes his ego seem he seems to be a fan of. So I'm sure there was just I, you know I'm sure there's a, there's that as well. I, I, I suppose it is. I, yes, and and but, but still, why would you stop? Like, oh no, I, I actually don't really care about Donald Trump just because he's like his politics don't really agree with mine. Even though I thought Tom Brady was actually, you know, leaning right at least. <laughs> well, and um, the other funny thing is that he's trying to distance himself, trying to tell him he wasn't in like a big fan of Trump, but everyone else on that Patriots team was. Like, obviously, Trump and Robert Kraft, who's the owner of the Patriots, are still good friends. He's still good friends with Bill Belichick, even though he's the coach of the team. But they don't sure. give Belichick as much crap as they give Tom Brady because no one really likes Belichick anyway. They don't really care. Right. So like Brady's <laughs> like the, like the one like golden child. It's like it, it's clear that he was a supporter of Trump at one point in time. Like I said, now that he's transitioning onto into his life and that he doesn't want you know those things to come in because look, if you're going to work into the media, we all know that you know the media only accepts one kind of viewpoint. So you have to come yeah. out and announce yourself to be the peer for, for, from any kind of right-leading ideals that you may have if you want to laugh there. And they're paying them a lot yeah. of money. I mean, they're talking about this, like, what, a quarter of a billion-dollar contract that, that he's signing over the next 10 years since the deal with Fox. So it, it's not cheap. So, hey, look, if you want that money, you got to, you know, dance through the hoops. And that is essentially what Tom Brady's doing here. I know the the rest of you guys on the podcast aren't exactly big sports fans, but are there any uh, thoughts that you have regarding uh, this story with, with Brady and Trump as far as like the media goes? I, I used to be a big sports fan, not anymore because of how mm -hmm. political sports has become and how yeah. insufferable a lot of the people involved in sports are. But uh, well, well uh, real quick before you, before you go on, I just want to let everyone know that Cassie was at one point a New York Jets fan. So I knew you were going to say. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> If, I if, if don't know the after show, show last week. I think it was, and I was like, "Oh, they're talking about something I don't know. They're talking about American <laughs> football." I was like, "Yeah, yeah. what is this? So what football. is this?" The greatest. If, if anyone, oh, if, if yeah. anyone has caused, uh, <laughs> if anyone has caused Cassie uh, more pain and suffering as a sports fan, it is in fact Tom Brady. So uh, yes. I'll let you go ahead and continue. 
Yes, to me, the Jets, uh, their real name is the goddamn Jets. It's not just the Jets. <laughs> but uh, yeah. for a very long time, uh, Tom Brady has been an enormous pain in my ass. But I will say that it seems like, uh, you know, for me, I think Tom Brady is one of the greats. I've said that I think God is a, is a, is a Patriots fan up until he went to another team and proved that he can win without the Patriots. <laughs> but yeah. Because of, uh, some of the things that he's done is literally insane. Like, I, yeah. I don't understand. I, I'll never understand. I don't think it's possible. Like, the dude, to me, has defeated all odds in some ways that I think is not even realistic it seems like fairy tale with some of the things he's been able to accomplish but uh yeah it just seems like the dude just doesn't want to get into politics he probably does like trump he doesn't really have a problem with trump he probably does agree and disagree with some things that trump you know supports and is against like the dude you know i think the dude clearly wants to express that he's an individual that has his own thoughts and he doesn't really want to be characterized especially by these fucking media critics and all that stuff who don't really care about individual people anyway unless they want to demonize them they don't care they don't they don't want people to be individualists they want them to fall into the giant conglomerate in which they can either a if you're not with them throw you off the cliff or b if you're with if you're with them well we'll protect you and they want to figure out like what basically what side Tom Brady is going to choose and how are they going to then try and deal with him sort of thing. So I think it's fine. Like I, I do agree with uh, Tom Brady wanting to be treated as an individual instead of by like a party narrative or whatever. So he's clearly just saying like, yeah, I, I agree with some things. I disagree with some things overall. My, I'm my own person. Like, back off sort of deal yeah. but uh I, I will say though the one thing i don't like about tom brady is the way he kissed his son but yeah that's another story <laughs> yeah well, well we'll leave that in the back burner especially with today with like, the ricky martin news i don't think we need to <laughs> delve into that side ricky uh, martin story. News. Huh. uh yeah so, so, just, so just go ahead and uh google ricky martin nephew yeah go ahead all, and, all i have to say well, about this I All I have to is. say about that is Viva Puerto Rico, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did the right yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, Sarah, so so you're a big uh, NFL fan, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> I know who Tom Brady is, but that's it. I, I watch football uh, once a year if we get invited to a, a, a Super Bowl party or if we host right. one. But, yeah, so, so. Um, based on what you read, it seemed like he was being very measured about what he said. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was a, a, a Trump supporter and like a friend of his and just wanted to like make sure that he kept his position and was like putting his career. I don't know if I, I do the same thing, but I kind of respect it. I don't know. Yeah. Just kind of keep trying to keep his distance. Was, oh, yeah. Man, have his cake was think, cause, Cause you remember like years ago it was the whole thing with like Taylor Swift because Taylor Swift, refused to condemn Donald Trump for so many years and everyone just assumed that, that she was a Trump supporter. So it's like every time they would go on like on these media tours like does just she support Trump because she's not saying anything. That means she supports Trump. And then I guess yeah. she finally caved a couple of years ago and came out as like this big like you know lefty bot. So that's I guess yeah. they finally got what they wanted with her, but Tom yeah. not so much. It's really annoying that you have to like come out and say that you dislike this person or else, you know. Like, yeah. Just right. let people have no opinion. Like he's. Just, it sounds he's like we're, for, we're forcing a lot of people to come out these days. It's just kind of odd how that that works yeah. out. Uh, TTW, any any thoughts about this? I know you're not a big football guy, but you know, nah, I'm hell no. Story. I, I really have no thoughts on this other than the fact that it is very pathetic that you know people have to, all, you know, disassociate themselves with people you know, with certain people just to, like, keep their position. Whether it's Donald Trump or anybody, I think that's always just pretty pathetic. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to disassociate yourself with someone, just, I mean, dissociate yourself with um, someone, you know, based on a reason, like, maybe they've done something that's just, like, you can't forgive or something like that. But and it's because of their political ideology. That's just freaking retarded. I agree. So uh, I just wanted to go ahead and wrap the story. I did want to bring up something that Josh said. Now, obviously, we have to throw a bone to Josh because he he's our, our British football friend. So you know, I throw a ball to him. But over the I'm last a few years, here. 
I'm yeah. the minority. <laughs> You're finally a minority, y'all. They're all I'm the guys. real minority <laughs> here. <laughs> so, um, so the thing with like the English like football league is that the British Premier League, which is obviously the major soccer league over there, is that over the last couple of years, ever since the whole George Floyd incident, that they've been taking a knee for like all of their games in support of Black Lives Matter, and they've done this for like literally every single game that they played out there. They're even doing it in like in other countries. Like exactly, like they're going to like countries like Hungary and, and Poland and stuff like that and taking the knees out there where those countries are, let's just say, not uh, very friendly to, to common, commie ideas, to say mm. the least. So it's not being very well received. So Josh is a, is a uh, lifelong Chelsea fan by lifelong, I mean, at least two or three years. Um, what are your <laughs> whole thoughts on just kind of them uh, taking over the uh, uh, taking over the sports field in your country as well? Yes, right. So first of all, I'm gonna learn you, mate, because this is a 2012. This is a 2012 Chelsea Chelsea war when we won the Champions League in 2012. So at least oh, 10 okay. years. Give me that. At least, at least <laughs> give me that. So so you <laughs> weren't even there when you weren't even there when Dropo was like part of the team like in 04 when they first won there. The big uh, that, that, yes, that, I was part of it, man. I was part okay. of it. I've been a Chelsea supporter since I was like I don't know seven, eight. So that was that's at least sixty decades ago. Sixty decades, six decades ago. Yeah. No, I'm not six. I'm not six. I, I was gonna give you thirty, but I mean, you can go ahead and stretch up. Oh, you can. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, my son. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, no, but, yeah, right. So we talk about but well, specifically about sports and whatever, right? So I, that was like the one thing because I actually stopped watching football like five years ago or something like that. Yeah. And and when I started, you know, noticing this trend that people were taking the knee just because of the Black Lives Matter, um, whatever movement or like trend, I actually prefer to call it a trend because it's a trend. Um, I'm deeply disappointed, but uh, you know, at the club because and England as well. England is also yeah. taking the knee. Like That's a couple big, of weeks like, ago, it, they were just taking the knee, and I was like. Dude, there is no racial oppression in England. That's like that thing did not exist that years ago, 50 years ago, maybe maybe 40, 50 yeah. years ago, but no, not modern day England. It's just like it's one thing that does not exist. And that's the thing. Yeah. It's like, why are we appropriating all these, you know, things coming from America? That don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm like, saying maybe I'm there's like myself, a thing. I'm thinking to myself watching this, it's like I'm watching the English uh, men's team go all the way to Hungary and in protest in the name of George Floyd, who was someone who died in Minnesota in America, wasn't even in their country. It's like, what are you guys yes. doing? Like, what, what is the point of all this outside this point of the virtue thing? Like, like right. what, what are we doing here? <laughs> it's mocking empty shame, sim- bro. Yeah, I'm it's empty you, that <laughs> Yes, it, no, it's virtue signaling. That, yeah, uh, basically that word, that's the way it is, right? Yeah. 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 This is just virtue signaling. Yeah, it was... Well, when, you, when you look at the two political parties, like here in the United States and the one in England, so obviously let's say the Democrat Party or like the left wing party here in the United States and in the UK, it's the, um, the Labour, Labour Party, right? Labour. Yeah. 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 The, the only real difference is that the Labour Party tends to be a, a teed more uh, anti-Semitic when it comes to some of their uh, statements. It, <laughs> it, well, yeah, but that, that's States. because right. That's that's basically because they kept they they basically kept the roots. Yeah, as opposed exactly. to the the Democratic Party in the U.S., that was, that I think they're just kind of like, oh well, I guess we're just gonna try minorities this time, <laughs> see how that yeah. works. And minority is like such a broke concept as well. It's not just like we're talking about right. So minorities, because it was like, oh, brown people, black people, whatever. Now minorities is like transgenders, all the alphabet people, and that's it. They're minority, and they're voting for them. That's the problem. Eighty-one million yeah. apparently. Allegedly, voted Allegedly. for the the president of the U.S., the current president of the U.S., and I'm like, well, I don't know. And what's the disapproval rating at the moment? Uh, it's, it's the lowest it, that it's ever been 61%. for a guy who hasn't even said. No, that, that, that's a, that's the approval rating. But the, same oh, same okay. thing though. Disapproval rating, yeah, yeah. right? But the approval rating is like the lowest like ever. It, right. it hasn't even been two years yet. It hasn't even been yeah. two years. <laughs> and, and nobody uh, believes that Joe Biden has actually finished his term. He won't. And that's the problem. I mean, because it, it, now it, you've got it, a bigger like a bigger problem coming. It's like you don't he, want he, Kamala Harris. You just don't. No. Nobody wants no. Kamala Harris. Did not even <laughs> not even, not even Joe Harris. Biden wanted Kamala Harris before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I yeah, think the feeling was mutual. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, when when I pass when I pay like uh four dollars and uh forty four cents for gas here in Georgia, I'd be like, We did it, Joe. Everything goes so much better now in just eighteen months. It's did great. you did we, you see the sticker on the on the gas pump? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot of them. I think yes, some people just... are like trying to like rip them off because you know they're, they're butt hurt because they don't want to take any responsibility for the way that they voted a couple of years yeah, ago yeah. or allegedly voted a couple of years ago. I mean, I, I, think some, sure. I, I think some dead people. I think some dead people screwed us over a couple of years ago. I'm just gonna throw it out there. Yeah, yep. exactly. Possibly, but those yeah. Guys. totally screwed us over. <laughs> so yeah, let, let, let's move on to to a much uh, happier topic. This is something that I know Rob's been looking forward to uh, all day. And it's the topic of Mickey Rourke and Mrs. Oh. Tom Cruise. <laughs> oh, that, that's the happy one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, obviously, Mickey Rourke, who I don't know if you guys knew, is uh, still alive. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just about to ask that question. But, yeah, okay, cool. And he's still attempting to look 40 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. and then that's another thing. I think he his old excuse used to be like, "Well, you know, I did a lot of boxing and it messed up my face." Like, ah, I think plastic surgery messed up your face there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 All, uh, he was also in a motorcycle accident that all didn't help. So, but yeah, plastic surgery. Yeah. So Mickey Rourke came out of nowhere and basically slammed Tom Cruise in the box office <laughs> of Top Gun Maverick. So. Quick little note here, uh, Top Gun Maverick is the number one uh, movie in the world right now. It's made over $1.2 billion at the box office so far. And it's wow. the highest freaking, uh, highest grossing movie worldwide, highest grossing movie domestically right now. And as it stands, it's the highest grossing movie in the history of Paramount Studios. It's made $600 million domestically so far uh, this year. So this movie is absolutely killing it. And if you look ahead of some of the movies that we got coming out in the next few months, I don't really think anything's going to top this. Uh, anything coming out this year? I mean, if Doctor Strange and Thor didn't come close, I don't think this mill is going to reach that uh, milestone either. So, um, But Mickey Rourke is apparently not impressed with Tom Cruise's acting or the success of his movie. So I talked about this. Oh, yeah. So even the movie uh, Top Gun Maverick has even surpassed the amount of tickets that were sold for James Cameron's Titanic in 1997 so just kind of compare like somehow he's even sold more tickets than that film there all the way back then but uh mickey Rourke is not impressed the iron man 2 actor appeared on pierce morgan's uncensored and slammed tom cruise as irrelevant and brought up when morgan brought up his uh boss up success when um he asked him about top gun mickey Rourke said that that shit that, be, that doesn't mean shit to me tom cruise has been doing the same part for 35 effing years i got no respect for that i don't care about money or power I care about when I watch Al Pacino or Christopher Walken working or uh, De Niro's early work or Richard Harris or Ray uh, Whitstone. He said, those, that's the kind of actor I want to be like. A lot of those guys that tried, uh, that, uh, tried to stretch as actors. When asked uh, if he thought that Tom Cruise was a good actor, work responded, I think he's irrelevant in my world. <laughs> so that was the kind yeah. of like, direct quote uh, there. So uh, this obviously got a lot of people talking about to kind of Tom Cruise as an actor and kind of his legacy in Hollywood. Now, over the last 10 years or so, he's been uh, more of like a big uh, time, I guess you could say, movie star because he's attached himself to a lot of like franchises like Mission Impossible. Uh, there was a, other, a couple other movies that they tried to jumpstart, if you remember, The Mummy, which bombed horribly. They tried to uh, do a franchise oh, based yeah. off of that, but that film did so terribly, they scrapped all the plans for it. There's other big name films like Oblivion, um, Edge of Tomorrow, and other things of that nature. So he's been in a lot of big name movies over the last few years. This is kind of another one uh, on here. And it talks a little bit more about the success that he's had with the film. Now, apparently, there's talk about possibly doing uh, a second one, but they don't know exactly if that's going to work or not. Because obviously, if they're going to do, I don't mean the second one, I mean a third Top Gun movie, but a second one from this mm-hmm. one. Um, because obviously Tom Cruise has to be like fully on board with the third one, and they're still kind of like working things out if they want to do that or not. Uh, Miles Teller even said it's pretty much up to Tom Cruise if they're gonna uh, do that. So uh, that just goes on the Tom Cruise thing. Now, Mickey Rourke did make one more uh, point. I guess when he was asked about the downfall of his own career, he says that I take blame for that. I became, as my therapist told me, a scary person to deal with. I didn't know how to turn the off switch off. He said. He also went and said that people who come from an authoritarian place, like producers who think that they can treat you a certain way, are the ones with power and money. He said they finally ran into a cat who didn't give a fuck about their power and money. 
And he said he basically kind of blames like his attitude for the downfall uh, of his career. And kind of the, the last little uh, note about this one, which I kind of found a little bit uh, ironic, uh, he's calling Tom Cruise irrelevant, is that Mickey Rourke's next film is going to be directed by the famed Roman Polanski, who uh, famously had sex with a 13 year old girl and then fled the country back in the 70s and never came back. So uh, yeah. we're just going to talk that one out there on our top bill <laughs> right now. Okay. So That's really good. I want to ask kind of kind of two questions here. The first one is going to be about what do you think about his statements on Tom Cruise as an actor, and kind of what do you think about the general statement of uh, Tom Cruise in general. So I want to ask you guys. I'll start with Sarah and kind of move around. Do Do you think that uh, Mickey has any merit with the, his comments about Tom Cruise not being a great actor as compared to the greats that he says it, or do you think that it's kind of just more him being bitter? Yeah. Does like does he understand the concept of like character acting and movie star acting? Because <laughs> it sounds like he thinks the character acting is the only thing that has merit. But Tom Cruise is like an amazing star. Like he yeah. just has that quality that you can't fake that makes you magnet on a screen. Mm. And there's you should respect that as an actor. I feel like you should respect that. I am a character actor, but. I, so I have a lot of respect for people who like, they just are, if they're themselves, then they draw an audience. That's, that's yeah. very magical to me. So, I mean, Mickey Rourke can have his opinion or whatever, and he's probably <laughs> a little bit better because his career is not nearly as good as Tom Cruise, but you know, I don't know. It, it just, it's kind of pointless. Uh, let, me, let me ask Rob this because I think there's a point to make about Tom Cruise's career kind of the last few years. Like I said, he's pretty much gotten over like his, his name, his star power. He's doing like a lot of franchise films, but they just kind of dismiss Tom Cruise as an actor in general, because I think there's a lot of uh, people who will look back at Tom Cruise's older movies that he did kind of before, like his Top Gun success, even a little bit after when he did try to do different things. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, was in films like, um, Magnolia. He did like interview with a vampire. There's obviously uh, bigger uh, movies that he did like back in the '80s that kind of like tested his range. So to say that he's never done that as an actor, I think it's kind of a stretch. But do you think that he's kind of coasted over the last few years, kind of by his name? Like, do you think that there's some merit to what he's saying here, or what is your thoughts on the whole situation? Yeah, I I kind of put it put Mickey Rourke's comments in a certain category um, because Mickey Rourke has a tendency to like give interviews to TMZ. Like he's, you know, he's just like haunting someplace in LA and TMZ's there with a camera. So he does yeah. he'll periodically kind of shit on somebody or give his, give his no holds barred opinion. And you have to understand where he's coming from. He's, he is a slightly embittered, at least a slightly embittered actor whose career didn't really pan out. He was, actually somewhat i don't know if he was an ever an a-list star in the 80s but he was mm -hmm. a pretty hot commodity with the pope of greenwich village and diner and yep. uh nine and a half weeks and i mean he was in a lot of different stuff um that got a lot of attention it I, I just think by the early 90s those roles dried up and and obviously he had issues with plastic surgery his motorcycle accident all of that so his comments about tom cruise okay i am not the biggest tom cruise fan okay I think his best work is probably Magnolia, Eyes Wide Shut, um, even Vanilla yeah. Sky, which I know gets made fun of, uh, is actually my favorite Cameron Crowe movie, and I think he's great in it. Um, but yeah, Tom Cruise has a tendency to, as there's, he's a star, and so he's going to be attached to ve vehicles that present him in a certain capacity as, you know, the hero, and his charisma is what comes across and sort of creates that audience. Now, far be it from me to say, you know, I don't really like Tom Cruise movies. Plenty of other people do. The Edge of Tomorrow, Oblivion were huge box office hits for being relatively small budgets. And so regardless of the project he's on, they tend to be very successful. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of what Mickey Rourke is saying ultimately, like kind of just couch the bitterness and what it is. But he's basically saying he he's in these studio vehicle movies and Mickey Rourke sort of like butted heads with producers and the people that basically work with Tom Cruise and, and Cruise himself has become a producer has become very successful, uh, you know, being part of these movies past just being an actor. So that's kind of how I see it. It's, it's I try to have a more balanced look instead of being like Mickey Rourke's just washed up. I mean, the wrestler to me, the wrestler was a great role, a great movie. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I think he should have won Best Actor over Sean, who won for Milk that year. Um, yeah, really. But yeah, it's yeah, Mickey Rourke is very much at the end of his career. Yeah, hey, that, he definitely had. Uh, I was when that movie quick. come out, the, re- the, the wrestler, when not that movie come out? I want to say 2008. 2008? Was it 2007, 2008? I think. Maybe it was oh, 2008. Wow. Somewhere around there. Oh, yeah, uh, I was just going to mention real quick, then I'll go back to Josh, is that, you know, Mickey Rourke did have, like, a little slight comeback there for a few years because of that film in The Wrestler, because, like I said, he wasn't in a great position in his career, like, back then, and he kind of came out of nowhere with a, a role that got a lot of word of mouth, and people, like, started talking about him, and then... Like I said, he, he used that one to propel himself to get to, like, the Iron Man role. He was in, like, the Expendables for a little bit. So he did have a little bit of a career surges, but now it looks like he's kind of back to, like, where he was before that whole thing. Well, I'll be happened, honest. So. I'll be honest with something. I didn't know who Mickey Rourke was when I saw him on screen in Sin City. When I was 16 years oh, old, oh, I saw Sin City yes. in the movie theater. I was like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And, you know, and he, he's so good. And it was like, it was he's Mickey great in the role, Rourke. yes. Yeah. That, that was another one, but in those three movies, and then kind of it was kind of over. It did, he did Sin City, he did The Wrestler, and he did Iron Man Two, uh, which again, I, I I'm not a big Marvel fan, but I thought that like he was okay Iron in that. Which is trash. it's interesting though that you yeah. bring that up because <laughs> uh, because um, I think that John Favreau might have wanted to do the same thing with Mickey Rourke than he did with uh, for or for actually. Um, Robert Downey Jr. as well, right? Because both actors that they climbed, they, they were like huge successes in the 80s, 90s as well. And they had a decline. And then it just kind of came. Well, Robert Downey Jr. actually came back because of the the, the first Iron Man movie, thanks to John Favreau. Yeah. And I think that's probably the reason why they maybe simplistic, but maybe that's the reason why they actually got I never thought about it until you just brought it up, Rob. So I'm like, yes, that's probably the reason he was brought up. You know, his brought uh, he, he was cast as oh gosh, I can't even English today. He was cast yeah, as I've been the, there um, <laughs> yes, wasn't it? What's the name of the, the character? Whatever, in Iron Man 2, right? Because I they wanted something, to, uh, is it like Ivan? Yeah, yeah, with Ivan, Ivan, yeah. yeah. Russian Russian. character. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the, yeah. the, the, the Red Crimson that, that's that's the name in the comics. I that's uh, Red oh. Crimson, no, no, not Red Crimson, Crimson, whatever. So, it's like, yeah, probably, probably one of the reasons he was, you know. Chose for the role. I'll yeah. Know. Just spitballing here. <laughs> well, well, Cassie, let me ask you, because um, you're always a big movie fan here. So what, what do you think of kind of Tom Cruise as, as an actor? And do you think that uh, Mickey Rourke kind of has a point of what he's saying? Or do you find it's more like bitterness towards him? Because like I said, a lot of people say that it's bitterness and jealousy. I don't really think that. I think Mickey Rourke truly believes what, like, what he's saying. But I think he's coming at it in a very, you know, blunt-headed uh, perspective, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just find it interesting that both of these actors, like, some of their earliest, biggest roles were in Essie Hinton books that were adapted into film. Mickey Rourke did Rumblefish, and uh, uh, Tom uh, Tom Cruise, he did uh, The Outsiders, awesome. both of which I really enjoyed for what they were. And it's like it's like in a way they kind of like sprouted from the same kind of deal, and it's interesting to see where both of their careers had ended up. Um, I think that Mickey Rourke is just kind of acting like an old guy that thinks that there's only one way to get to the top, sort of deal, and he just doesn't think that the way Tom Cruise did it is uh, at least acceptable to him. I'm not really the biggest Tom Cruise fan. There's some things that I like him in, some things I don't really care for. And he does kind of take roles that that are pretty similar to each other. But, I mean, um, typically when you do watch a Tom Cruise movie, at least the ones I've watched, uh, I can at least expect some level of um, quality to them. So, I mean, just that alone, I think, is, is important, especially nowadays. I mean, people really love the new Top Gun and, and feel as though there's, there's a good level of quality to that. And I think that's something that I think is important nowadays when it's so easy to just throw out, throw shit at the wall and see if it sticks with Hollywood and all that. Like there's, they're so used to that. So if there's an actor that I could say, well, every time I've seen his movie, you know, whether it's not like the most liked thing ever or not, at least, oh, there's, there's quality to, to the work that's presented, you know, and, and I'm sure that's not that doesn't go exactly with just the actor, but it's a trend and I can respect that trend, even if it's like a small thing. 
But I think uh, Tom Cruise has earned his keep. I mean, you know, an important thing is the dude does so many things that most actors are just unwilling to do. And a lot of people don't necessarily realize that because, well, they're just they're just looking at the movie for what it is. But the dude does a lot of stunt work that the mass majority of actors would never even try to attempt. And that's like one thing about him that I do respect that, that you know, I don't I think Mickey Rourke isn't taking into account when he does give his personal opinion about Tom Cruise. You know, I think that, that his work is important and and does deserve to be praised for for a lot of things that maybe Mickey Rourke may be glancing over. I remember yeah. the one Mission Impossible movie. He, I, I think it was the last one he did. He f- like fractures his ankle doing one of the yeah. like one of the stunts, and it was yes. just like I remember watching it. It was just like oh, and it's like that's yeah. real. You can't fake things like that where it's just like it's apparent how like. And again, that's yeah. that's the thing about movie. Hey, just keep in mind, fra- fractured his ankle and still climbed up and ran like two or three feet to finish the scene too. Right, like broken ankle. Right, he kept. Yes. It was he like, kept the scene going. It's like that's an the athlete. Thing. It's like it's it's Tom Brady, like you know, coming back in the fourth quarter and you know mm-hmm. or whatever. But it's just like that's it, that that's hard to sort of uh, sum up how how valuable that is in a movie. Yeah, definitely. yeah. I mean, well, that's. Like, that's- are there- I was gonna say, look, there's a lot of things you can criticize Tom Cruise for, but you can't criticize his commitment to filmmaking whatsoever. I mean, he's one of yes. the few guys that still gives a shit about the true art of fil- filmmaking when it comes to stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. well, he's basically just become the American Jackie Chan. All of his stunts, right? He's uh, no, oh, not wrong. A heli- <laughs> yeah. and, and that's that's the thing, though, because because it's, it's the same thing, right? So it's like, oh, there's an helicopter scene in the next impossible Mission Impossible. Well, I better learn how to fly one. And he does yeah. fly the, the helicopter <laughs> in that movie. And yep. same Top Gun, right? So, oh, I guess I need to fly like an F-15 or whatever. Well, mm-hmm. I guess I should better start learning how to fly an F-15. Now, not flies. only did he flew fly one, but he pretty much uh, taught, uh, taught the cast. Well, like, the rest of the cast fly well. one as well. well yeah, so. Yes. Ridiculous. But at the same time, that's the one thing that keeps me entertained watching Tom uh, Tom Hanks. No, not Tom Hanks. Yeah. I hate Tom Hanks. Tom, <laughs> Tom Cruise's <laughs> movie. Yeah. Right? yeah, Tom Hanks is not jumping out of the helicopter anytime soon unless he's being tossed out by no, uh, he's probably dictator. right. No, 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 no. He right. If he's riding the helicopter, he's probably going to one of Jeffrey Epstein's islands or whatever, right? So. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, his name's on the list. Just put it out there. Um, it but uh, uh, T.W., so let me ask you, did you watch Top Gun? Because I want to ask you, did you actually see that movie? Or have you seen that movie yet? Oh, yeah, shit. I meant to see it, but I never got a chance to. Um, mm-hmm. But I've been hearing lots of great things about it. Um, but, yeah, in terms of this, like, little thing, I mean, honestly, you got to respect how dedicated, you know, Tom Cruise is to, like, the art of filmmaking and shit like that. But he... Mickey Rourke isn't wrong where it's like he is kind of playing the same role, like, you know, like over and over. But I mean, that's not a bad thing if the movies are successful and, you know, like decent at least. And, um, but I mean, the thing about it is, it just, yeah, it just kind of sounded a bit bitter from Mickey Rourke's perspective. Cause, like, I mean, I know he was like in an interview, so it's not like he was just like randomly saying these things. But the thing about it is, man, I mean, he could have just said, oh, you know, in terms of, like, Top Gun success, he could have just said, oh, that doesn't mean anything to me, and then, like, move the fuck on. Like, he has to go all about, like, you're going to play the same role for 50. Like, bro, why add that extra shit in? Because then that makes you look like a hater. <laughs> like, why yeah. add that yeah. extra shit in? Just say it doesn't mean shit to me, and then move the fuck on from that point. <laughs> Right. I'm thinking to myself, like, did these two have like some kind of like unresolved beef from like maybe that's what I'm that? saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny they started. They basically started acting at the same time, the early 1980s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yep. I think that, it, and, and it's funny Cassie made that connection because they're both Francis Ford Coppola movies as well. Um, Rumblefish and The Outsiders. Rumble, by the way, I prefer Rumblefish just because The Outsiders is just so cheesy and like. You know, <laughs> I love them both for different reasons. Yeah, I think Rumblefish is 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 pretty good, and I think it gives a good, uh, interesting look at. I think it's Tulsa, yeah. where it's look where they sh- where they shot that, where it takes place. Yeah, yeah. They're not the same well, age, uh, though, are they? 
No, uh, Rourke is like maybe nine years, nine, ten years older than, than uh, uh, yeah, Bruce. Exactly, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What sucks is, you know, I like Mickey Rourke as an actor for some of the mm -hmm. things that he's done. He's done a lot of niche, interesting things that I do like to look back on. And what's sad is that, like, you know, the fact that his career kind of is, like, dwindling at this point, that this will probably be, like, the thing he's most known for in the next five to ten years. And that, that to me, is the saddest thing of all, that you're right. going to just say all this stuff and it's like just work on your craft man I, I do wish the best for the dude you know but uh yeah it's no good to do this and then it have that be the lasting effect on the remainder of your career well he would have had a better career if he was better at personal relationships and that's something that um, yeah. i personally identify with um you know because <laughs> i tend to also have problems with personal relationships and um it's just no it's just, i like i like prickly people i like people that are a little difficult however you can see how self-destructive that can be and how it's just like oh yeah. you're just you can't get out of your own way can you so that's all, it's also just a, exactly. a tragic sort of hollywood arc of like he there's talent there he was well liked yep. he didn't get along with the people he needed to to have a long lasting career tom cruise had a burning desire to be successful not just successful but to be the best in terms of a hollywood star he succeeded he's literally been at the top for 30 years as an a-list i would say he's actually a, a biggest box office you know what would you call it a drag that right uh then the rock at, the, uh, at this moment so i'm like well, the I, rock, I prefer, I would, the rock would, box office draw what is he? What is What's he, he though? <laughs> is it? Well, look, people are going. Look, people are going to start flocking to the, the theater when the this awful movie, the um, Black Adam the movie, yeah, when the Black Adam comes out, and I'm like, dude, no, I want to watch Maverick. I haven't seen it, so I, but I would watch it again. I'm pretty sure <laughs> if it came out at the same time. <laughs> so you had a successful Shazam movie that came out. Well, when was that? Three years ago, and yeah, and now you're following. You're following it up with an anti-hero movie that's loosely connected. Yeah, I just, I, I, I we'll see. It might. Is anyone actually I, excited I, for that? No. I, I don't know. Oh, no, I I know. We, we've been talking about. It. Yeah, we've been talking it, it about it. How awful, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot of these like superhero movies, like we talked, we've been saying for years, like oh, it's running its course, but they still make money. But it really feels like this year people have just started to grow tired of it. I don't know if it's just the way that the economy is. People are thinking twice about spending all that money to go see the newest Marvel movie, but it's like Thor's probably going to end up doing less than Doctor Strange. And even though with this Black Adam film, I mean, the whole draw is just watching The Rock in a superhero movie. So it's like, how badly do you yeah. really want to see that movie, all things considered, right now? So, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you have the, the Black Panther movie that's supposed to come out in November. It's four months away from its release. We haven't seen a single uh, a teaser for it whatsoever. We don't know what the plot's going to be about. And for what it looks like, it's just going to be about Black Panther's like female heroine that has nothing to do with the title character whatsoever. So they're going to like MCU it up real bad. I mean, that, that's all. That's all we know, and then that, that's pretty much all you have left for the for the superhero films for the remainder of the year. So I don't know. Uh, any last any last thoughts on this one before we move on to our closer? Nah. Yeah. No. All right, then. Well, let's go on and move to our, our closing topic. Uh, Cassie, Miss Cassie Cage, as you all know, is uh, half Puerto Rican, very, very proudly. And Puerto Rico is very, very close to Cuba. Now, you might think that those things have nothing to do with one each other, and they don't. I just want to bring that up to talk about our closer, <laughs> which is Jamie Lee Curtis versus Cuban. So this is a story that came out earlier this week. That I, saw it I, I saw it today, and I was like, what is she talking about? Exactly. Yeah, when I saw one of the most week, racist comments ever made this year. <laughs> well, when yeah, I saw it earlier really. this week, it's like, what good come, can come out of you admitting this to the press? Absolutely. Nothing. Right. Even it's if you're there. apologizing, it's still pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> if, just real quick before we get into the story. If you remember a couple of years ago, uh, Liam Neeson made some comments in the media tour where he was talking about like one of his friends who had got raped like years ago. Yep. And he was so angry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went He's down very brave of him to do that. Yeah, if we're looking for like any black person that he saw that keep in mind, even when he was telling that story, he was telling it in the sense of, yeah, you know, that was bad. I really shouldn't have done that. You know, I don't right. feel proud about that moment. But people still gave him shit when he said it, though, right? And they're still yeah. making jokes about him being a racist and like all the good stuff. So now Jamie Lee Curtis has basically done the, the same thing and had her quote unquote racist moment. 
when she filmed the movie uh, Knives Out a few years ago, this is only about four or five years ago, with uh, Anna de Armas, she thought that she was inexperienced and unsophisticated because she looked like a girl who had just got off the boat from Cuba. So <laughs> for those of you who don't know, uh, Anna de Armas is in fact a Cuban actress. She was uh, born and raised in Cuba. She was there up until her teenage years. Then she moved to Spain, became an actress out there for a few years before she moved to America. She's been working in, in Hollywood for I think maybe about eight or nine years now. So uh, in, in the film, and we'll have to talk about this for Rob because I know he loves this movie too. And so, um, yeah, so we're talking about an actress who, keep in mind, before they even filmed this movie, she had been in movies like Blade Runner. I think she was in the, the War Dogs movie with Jonah Hill and uh, Miles Teller. So she had been in like some notable like films up to that point. I, but oh, go ahead. I actually used to confuse this one with, and, and I can't even remember the name, but Chris Hemsworth's wife. I thought this was. Oh, the one. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about. No, Chris Hemsworth is a totally different one. She's the one that just what's, did that Netflix series. What's the name? Can you, can you remember the name? Uh, to I, me, I it was it similar. I don't, I don't even know. I, I, just, yeah, I, don't I can't even know remember. But I, I was like, oh, yeah. Anna the Armas, yes. No. I, no, no. Chris uh, Hemsworth's Chris wife. wife is uh, Elisa Paskey, is her name? That's, oh, Pataki, yeah. right? Pataki. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she, yeah. She was the one who was in like the, the Fast and Furious movies with uh, Vin Diesel. So, yeah, yeah that's Hemsworth's wife. Or Let's yeah, not right. uh, confuse the most beautiful woman in the world with whoever Chris Hemsworth is married to. I mean, <laughs> agree on that? I mean, move on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, well, we're up to Rob. So yes. let's, let's move on. So, He's talking right, about so Jamie I, Lee Curtis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm about to say, I'm like, cool. you're talking about the other two. Anna de Armas. Anna de Armas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um okay so so anyway so she had done a few movies before this but this is the first time that they worked together so jamie lee curtis obviously had no idea who she was in, in the film when they started filming and because of the way that armor was dressed you know for her role in the movie so if you don't know we'll talk about it in a second here but because of the way she was dressed in, in the movie she thought that mm -hmm. she was inexperienced and sophisticated because she thought that she was an actress who had just came from Cuba, this is her first Hollywood movie role, even though it clearly wasn't. So in an interview with Elle magazine, Curtis talks about how she just assumed that the Armist just arrived in Cuba and was new to Hollywood when they first met on set. She said, and admitted this in an interview with a major magazine, she said that, I assumed, and I'll say this with real embarrassment, because she had just, because she had comes from Cuba, that I thought she had just arrived. I had made the assumption that she was inexperienced and unsophisticated young woman. That the first day I was like, oh, what are your dreams? That she oh, no. So she's sitting over here talking to her like she's like a, literally like a, this is like the first movie role she's ever done in her life. And she goes on to say the reason why she asked this was because she was so impressed by her personality that she wanted to introduce her to her godchildren, Maggie and Jake Gyllenhaal. But she was surprised to learn that Arma already knows Jake Gyllenhaal because they worked in the movie before this one. <laughs> Apparently, she also knows uh, Keanu Reeves like, as well. So we're now, talking about know, this. Uh, quick, ahead. quick thing that I just wanted to mention though. This is kind of like Taika Waititi wanting to cast that uh, Portman for a Star Wars movie. It's exactly yeah. the same thing. Oh, I didn't know who this and, person was. And not knowing so, that she was uh, a pimple yes. in like three other movies before that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, she had worked with I, Keanu Reeves in that Eli Roth movie, Knock Knock. Yeah, yeah, and I mentioned that in, in the article too. So, yeah, so it's like I said, she she's uh, come from she comes from Havana. She's worked as an actress for a number of years, both in Spain and in America. We talked about uh, that film. Um, so, in the movie, the the Knives Out movie, for those of you guys who don't remember or those of you who didn't see it, the whole point in the movie is that uh, Anna plays a, a character. She plays the nurse of like this this rich like patriarch, and it has like this big family, and he mysteriously dies. So all the family members come in. To, I guess divvy up the will and who's gonna get the house, who's gonna get like the fortune and whatnot. It's essentially a murder mystery uh, movie. But her character is supposed to be like the lonely like nurse who was kind of there because she was a friend to like the owner and whatnot. So she's dressed in a way that's very like let's just say uh, uh, homely, just just to say the least, to say uh, as safely as we can. So uh, apparently she uh, was so good at looking homely that Jamie Lee Curtis actually did think that she was somebody's maid and decided to talk down to her in the film. Now, the reason why I say this is very ironic is that the film Knives Out is supposed to be a movie that mocks uh, the Trump family. This is what right. Ryan Johnson, who is the uh, writer and director of this film, said, is that he was using this movie as kind of like an allegory to the Trump family. 
So this is supposed to mock. That's what that was supposed uh, to be about. Yeah, so this is a film that was supposed to mock what they viewed as the racism and the bigotry and the snobbery of the Trump. And then here is James oh, Lee Curtis, okay. super progressive liberal, explaining the exact same characteristics of that character in real life, unironically, by the way. I was just probably going to say that it was in character. No, I was yeah, actually, you know, just character. doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So her comments, Jamie Lee comments went, you know, viral and people started calling her out for essentially being a casual racist, right? So you had one uh, tweet here that says, the casual racism of Jamie Lee Kermit, uh, Anna de Arma is both uh, frustrating and totally expected. It's cringy as hell and also in line with how Americans are told to talk, uh, and taught to think about both Cuba and especially Hispanic people in general. And keep in mind, these are also like lefties and righties are coming out and slamming yeah, right. her. Here, here's another tweet that says, Jamie Lee Curtis really showed her white savior complex. Poor little uh, Latina from Cuba and her whole fucking chest were talking about uh, Anna de Armas. Imagine having the audacity to say something like this in this economy. It's baffling. Uh, here, here's another tweet. It says, pretty funny how everyone happily allowing Jamie Lee Curtis to coast along as a progressive elder uh, celebrity because she was vocally supportive of her trans daughter, only for her to go, no, no, don't worry, I'm quite racist. And then another uh, tweet here <laughs> that says that Jamie Lee Curtis, like a time and time again, proves that she's insanely stupid and like has backwards views of non-white people. It's a miracle her PR agent hasn't stepped in at this point. So a lot of people have been throwing uh, Jamie Lee Curtis under the bus for her very uh, quite bigoted comments. And I want to point this out too because this is actually something that uh, has been kind of key in Hollywood. Now a lot of people just assume especially when you're in that Hollywood bubble that Hispanic people are like only good for like being like made to like Hollywood celebrities. So whenever you hear um, someone talk about like a Hispanic person, when they're talking about like the border or something like that, they always say, Oh, okay. Well, well who's going to mow your lawns if you kick out all the Hispanic people? <laughs> the, the only thing that they're good for is like mowing lawns and being nervous <laughs> to, to do Hollywood celebrities. This is also a point, uh, Amber Heard, this is a story that I went back on years ago. This is oh, before no. the whole Johnny Jet situation. She made a similar joke saying that, uh, I just heard an ice uh, checkpoint in Hollywood, a few blocks from here, where I live. Everyone better give their housekeepers, nannies, and landscapers a ride home tonight. Now, keep in mind, she wrote that completely unironically, by the way. Mm -hmm. She wasn't like trying to make like a, a funny, like edgy joke. Like She actually thought that she was helping. Uh, quote unquote, by writing stuff like that. So I want to kind of get everyone's uh, comments about Jamie Lee's um, uh, comments and then kind of about uh, Anna and Armis uh, in the first place. So I want to start with Sarah. Uh, what do you think about uh, Jamie Lee Curd's uh, comments, basically putting her, a giant foot in her mouth? I think the story is hilarious. I wonder, yeah. she probably meant to mend it as like a funny story. Probably right. Like she, didn't, yeah. she wasn't like saying, "Oh, I was so racist for doing this." She probably just was like, "I was in character, and I was just being stupid." And her costume looked so realistic that I just like bought her character fully, and it was yeah. hilarious. But, but that's the thing, though. She didn't even set it up like that. She was like saying, "No, I legitimately thought that this girl just came fresh off of the yeah. book. I had it no was, idea who she was. <laughs> was just too good an actor." And mm -hmm. and then of course everyone takes it and runs with it with racism. She. I mean, it, it was obviously silly of her, but there's no harm there, you know. So, mm -hmm. so as uh, a Cassie, as someone who is uh, born somewhat near Cuba in, in the state of New York, which could be essentially Cuba when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, oh do, what do you God. think about this whole situation? Um, it it really sucks that Jamie Lee Curtis is the way that she is, but I mean. You mm -hmm. know, and this is coming from someone that I I've watched. Who loves Halloween. Halloween movies, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I, I watched the original Halloween when I was four years old because it's my mother's favorite movie. It's my favorite movie. It's like, like I grew up watching Jamie Lee Curtis and she's been a, like one of the stars that I could recognize, you know, as far back as I can remember because right. of how many things that she's involved in that I did enjoy. But um, you need to look at this from a perspective of the reality that this is not someone that was ever poor at any point in their lifetime. Yes. She was born to Tony, to Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. You right. know, she doesn't know what it's like to be a normal human being. And it shows <laughs> every time she opens her mouth. 
<laughs> and it, it's it, the sad reality of it is, and I think at this point she's kind of losing her mind uh, and basically all the things that she kind of used to hide about her internal racism because of the fact that she is classist. She doesn't know what it's like to be a regular person. She holds herself obviously above us and especially above people that are not of the same color as her too. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just disappointing. And, and like I said, I think at this point she's going a little senile because she made a big tweet back when uh, the 2020 election came that, oh, so some right wing people are hijacking fucking uh, male, the, the male man's fucking uh, truck to get those oh, yeah. mail in ballots. Remember, like, it's like, how yeah. fucking <sighs> insane can you be? Like, please just shut the fuck up. And it's sad because. I will say this about right. Jamie Lee Curtis. In terms of her acting ability, she has been a person that has put out quality content the mass majority of her career. Whether you like it or not, I think that the, ma the mass majority of things I've seen her in, she is given a good... Um, she's tried. And she genuinely does put her best foot forward with her craft. Even in her later movies when she could just say, fuck it and cash in. Like... Um, like uh, De Niro did for like 10 straight years. I mean, like, why not? She's fucking Jamie Lee Curtis. Why does she have to try anymore, you know? So, like, I can genuinely say as an actress, like, she definitely does take into, a bill into, into account quality with her work, even with her later work, even if it's something that I don't like. Like, I don't like Halloween Kills, but I think that she's still a good actress, and she genuinely tried. It's mostly the writing and, the, and uh, the, the direction of the films that she's involved in that are unfortunately going down the shitter. And even despite the writing and directing going down the shitter, she still attaches herself to, to Halloween, one of the most iconic franchises that literally threw her into stardom she was in um on the fog she was in a movie with um with arnold schwarzenegger and it's hilarious when she drops the uzi down the fucking stairs and it kills everyone like like there's so many little things that i remember about jamie lee curtis and for her to be a leftist looney tune and, and really <laughs> say stupid shit like this it it, it it's depressing that i have to realize that these people just suck Okay, I know Rob's a, a big uh, fan of Jamie Lee Curtis, so I want to hold off of him for a second. I'm going to go to EW here. Uh, what do you, what you kind of, what was your general feeling about uh, these statements here? That she would say something like this, and I'll, keep in mind, she's on set for a film where she's basically mocking people for having these types of views and having this type of ideology, and she's having it unironically behind the scenes. Like, what do you think Method acting, that? bro. Method yeah. acting. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for before, right? So, oh, no, no, no. Uh, Me actually uh, calling her out, you know, for being Cuban. Method acting. That's nah, it. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think she's probably just going senile in her old age, man. I think this is like, Oh, yeah, I think you? it might just be someone whose mind is like slowly deteriorating and shit. Um, is it racist? I don't know. Probably. I mean, you never know with some of these people, man. But yeah, I think it's more of just the fact that her mind just might be deteriorating and all that shit. But I mean, it is a stupid thing to admit. Yeah. Nevertheless, <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis, by the way, uh, older than Tom Cruise, younger than Mickey Rourke. I just throw that out there. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. In the um, right in between. And it's relevant yeah. to the previous conversation as well. Yep. So. Well, Rob, yeah. uh, go out there and defend your girl. What do you think about this? I'm I'm not going to defend her. Um, I mean, what I would say is that <laughs> no, I, I, I meant the, the Cuban one, not not the old white lady. Oh yeah, yeah. well she doesn't need to defend it. <laughs> oh, oh it's racist. Geez. You assumed. <laughs> her oh, I, I thought it was Jamie Lee. Was, uh, well, no, because right, Jamie Lee's the only one worth worthy of criticism here. So, um, I'm not going to defend her. This is what I'll say though: is actors want to be liked. Actors want to be liked, and they want to be considered for as many parts as possible and therefore they want to they want to appear a la mode you know in terms of the the thought you know the thought process the, the whatever the group think of the day they want to be able to follow that and jamie lee curtis was attempting to say i you know i've been i've been stupid before i've been silly i can't you know i thought that she was a girl off probably not even thinking what she was saying She's somebody that, as Cassie said, has been 
disconnected from everyday reality of what most people do and live and how they live. And so I think that it's, it's just kind of a, a, a transparent moment where it, she's uncomfortable because she's, she's kind of being honest, but her, mm -hmm. her perspective is so disconnected from reality. And so I, I find it odd that by the way, knives out, which I hated, um, was this supposed to be this critique of like Trump Trumpian or, or like yeah, rich well, rich Republicans? All. It's more that's more like elitist lib like leftists, like yeah. you know people who live in the those, cities uh, who have Connecticut. Like, I'm thinking it's more like those Connecticut, like New Jersey type liberals, like those right. that live in those big fancy homes like out there. But yeah, but th that's who it reminded me of was like disconnected wealthy elitists who are just like kind of all trying to figure out who's going to get the money or who killed this guy. And, you know, that's why that's why I hated Knives Out was it's it's the good angelic immigrant who's going to like, you know, reap the rewards. And it was just so classist and dumb. And it was just a very um, irritating movie. But. No, I mean, I, 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 I pity Jamie Lee Curtis a little bit just because it's like, you know, she's she's just trying to play the game and she really lost this hand badly. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I can say this is a definite uh, backfire. Uh, Josh, what was what your thoughts on the, this whole thing we kind of already talked about here? Right. So, um, well, for starters, um, I would like to say that I actually did write an article on Jamie Lee Curtis last year. In mm -hmm. August of last year, actually, um, I'm actually going to send it over to you. Actually, well, I time. actually might be able to find it real quick. So I just are we talking talk about, about her her commentary yeah, just... on Halloween Kills, the mob? Oh gosh, I don't know. Oh no, I, I made a was... video ripping that shit to bits. But there was there was this actually in August of last I mean, year. I found article. it. I wrote, I wrote the article. Please uh, pull it up because uh, I mean, look, there's information missing in there. I just looked it up as well. Um. But this basically, one, right? The, right, so basically the headline is that one. Jamie Lee Curtis says mm, she and her right. husband are proud to see the son transition into a woman. Right, so I didn't know how old the son was, and I know yeah. now. Uh, the son was is her husband, yeah. Well, 25 years old um, last year, so 26, I suppose, right now. And but at the moment, I actually treated that as like, oh, maybe the son is like, I don't know, five, ten years old or whatever. I was like, that's yeah. that's how I interpret it at the moment, right? Because she didn't say, she didn't disclose it. And then I, I found another article by the Sun, uh, posted in October, like three months later. No, no, no. Oh, uh, this person is actually twenty-five. And but but the, that, that's the thing. That's the one thing that because I've never seen her. In anything but the True Lies movie, because I, I so know, good though. I, I haven't seen Halloween or whatever. Right, it's a good movie. Yes, go watch it if you haven't seen it. True Lies is fantastic. Um, yeah. It's a good movie, yeah. and the striptease movie, uh, the, the striptease scene is not too bad. So uh, give it that. Um, it's, but yeah, it's and, amazing her flexibility in it. I, yeah. <laughs> I will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give thumbs up. Oh my god. She she probably um, liked uh she probably likes the idea of her son transitioning into a woman into a woman because it probably <laughs> reminds her of her father and some like it hot. Oh gosh, I don't I don't well, I don't I didn't see that at the moment, but <laughs> now I'm kind of like, oh gosh, I wish I could go back like a year ago and just <laughs> well, write it proper now. It's depressing uh, because she's married to Christopher Guest, and if anybody knows who Christopher Guest is, he's so he's a, he's a actor and a director, probably best known for being in The Princess Bride and This Is Spinal Tap. Oh um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. he he directed Best in Show. He's a really talented guy. I really like him a lot. I just you know it's like okay, well like, this is Hollywood. <clears throat> so basically, what, what I was trying to get to was that yeah, okay, that that actually at that, at that moment I was like, oh okay, she just wants to virtue signal whatever, right? Because whatever, it's, her career is, may may not be over, but she doesn't really have that many years in her career anyway. And I'm like, now yeah, she's yeah. just pandering to whatever is like. What? Sorry, mate. No, I think that was the echo. I didn't say anything. Oh, that was me. I was, yeah. I was right. So I was interrupting myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, real quick, I did want to uh, get this one real quick, and I'll jump back to you. So this is another article that I wrote years ago. So we brought up the one that you wrote years ago. Here's the one you wrote. That I wrote years ago about how Jamie Lee Curtis fully supports the Second Amendment. 
with conditions. And her oh, yeah. That nice. she said here was that I absolutely have no problem with people owning firearms, dot, dot, dot. If they have been trained, licensed, have a background check conducted, and a pause button, which uh, is given time to push the, for that process to take place. And then they have to renew the license for that gun, just like we do with uh, automobiles, which are also weapons. So she supports mm. the Second Amendment. Yeah, but, that was after her, she was getting criticized for uh, being a gun toting maniac in, in Halloween 2018. Something that, that she. I mean, obviously, yeah. she's against the Second Amendment, let's be real now, but at the end of the day, she's going to come out here and make her money. Yep. 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 So, so that's the thing. I actually mentioned the Second Amendment thing in my article as well. And I was like, yep, I, what are you trying to say? <laughs> like, I, are you conservative? Uh, are you pandering now? What is it? And so that's when, when the movie is. releases are around the corner. That's that's Well, that, that's, that's the thing. Who, who was it that, like, just just recently just did the same thing i was like oh, maybe i should not support this but i will actually support the current thing i mean well i i, I understand many do, i understand but... people seeing this as hypocritical i don't necessarily see it that way i don't see that like okay hollywood making money off of violence right you know narratively or whatever you know right, bloody, yeah, yeah. bloody action movies or, or gory horror movies I understand that sort of criticism, but I look at it like this. It's like you can personally be have whatever political viewpoint you want and you're creating, you know, you're creating art. So that's fine. However, I also think you don't you don't really know anything as an actor about guns. <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to trust what yeah. you say about that oh, issue because oh. you're not really educated. You make movies about that thing. It's made up. It's fictional characters. Alec Baldwin will disagree with you because he certainly knows about guns apparently, but he still managed to shoot somebody dead <laughs> like mm -hmm. last year. So, yeah. well, um, according to him, the gun shot itself, which is yeah, exactly he did what claim you know, that. Oh, and that do. they definitely shoot yeah. themselves all the time. That means he's very knowledgeable in you know, you know, with guns because guns actually fire themselves randomly. Yeah, I mean, look, especially <laughs> revolvers, the ones that you actually have to yeah, like, it was a revolver. Yeah, yeah, try. You have to actually try. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I mean, how many people have I killed shooting in a movie? No, I don't know where I'm going with this. Oh, in a video cool. game, none. <laughs> oh, I mean, in that like, video game, like yeah, Resident Evil, the Resident proper Evil. Resident Evil. You know, <laughs> not it, one living being, all of them zombies. You know, I think at this point, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, I think the best scenario is just for her to stop talking. Just promote your films. Do not have any insane leftist rhetoric to spew. Because every time she says she tries to to make this about something that it isn't, it just blows up in her face. I made a video, like, shortly after Halloween Kills came out, basically criticizing her about her saying that uh, the mobs, basically relating the mob uh, mentality in Halloween Kills to yeah. BLM. And I'm just like, you know, at the time you were saying that because people didn't see the movie and you, in a way, you know, you made it out to be as though, oh, the mob mm -hmm. in the film is a good thing for taking out Michael Myers when really the film itself showed that the mob is actually no better than michael myers and a filled with a bunch of stupid ass people so it's like you literally like at the time it was good for you to virtue signal and act like oh you know with the at the time of promoting the film with the black lives matter riots and all that shit like saying oh this mob is just like them and taking it to to the bad white evil murdering killer michael myers but then it's like when you actually watch the movie you realize how stupid the people are in the mob it's like that aged like milk you look like an idiot you pretty much make everyone mad and it's just please just stop talking like your career speaks for itself you have a long standing career of great film that i personally look back on fondly just stop talking and make whatever remaining money you have to make off of, you know, your your back catalog and get your new movies and continue to do what you do and then retire. Fucking just stop saying stuff. Mm -hmm. no, there's one more. 
Go ahead, uh, Rob. No, I just want to say, rarely is the mob, um, you know, good or seen in a positive light in movies. Okay, and it's yeah, like there's this great, there's this great movie. It's from like nineteen, I think it's from nineteen forty one, called the Oxbow Incident. It's very much about that, and it's an old western or whatever, but it's great because it's sort of like this, you know, why it basically points out why it's mob violence or mob justice or whatever almost never works out, and why we have the legal system we do anyway. Okay, so there's one more thing that I want to do, then we can go ahead and wrap this up. Now, we've all been pretty much dogging on uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. I want to spin this around and go back to uh, Miss Anna here, because this is an article that came out with uh, Breitbart earlier today. Now, the, obviously, the title of the article explains why Hollywood isn't the place for her to be. Now, I think uh, Breitbart picked it up because in their minds, it's like, oh, she's trashing Hollywood. She's telling them why Hollywood is bad. But I don't think they really paid attention to exactly what she said. She did in an in interview with Elle magazine, which I believe is the same outlet, which is kind of funny when you think about that. But uh, the reason why she said that she left uh, Hollywood, while she felt like it wasn't her for her anymore, is that she was dating Ben Affleck at the time. Now, if you've seen the movie, I think it was Open Water, with her Ben Affleck did, that was on Hulu earlier this year. Terrible mm -hmm. film, by the way. It's yeah. absolutely garbage. Don't <laughs> recommend it. But apparently they started dating while they were filming that film, because that was during like the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And she talked about how Hollywood became a bad place for her to be because of her relationship with Ben Affleck. And she was talking about how the paparazzi pretty much were stalking them nonstop while they were living in L.A. She says that uh, it was one of the reasons why she left. She wanted to say that, you know, around other people's lives in the entertainment industry, it's coming fishbowl with the paparazzi tracking their every move. It was an experience to go through that herself. This is not the place for me. It became a bit too much. There was no escape. There was no way out. It said for time in L.A., she said, it's always uh, felt like something that you don't have to. Uh, it said, it's always the feeling of something that you don't have, something missing, a city that keeps you anxious. So she basically said that she didn't like living in L.A. for that very reason. But then the very next uh, note on here is that she's now, when you move away from L.A., you figure you go to somewhere a lot quieter, maybe a lot more private. Yeah, she exactly. New York. She went to New York. So essentially she went to the east side oh, yeah. of what Los Angeles <laughs> is. Because now she lives with her uh, boyfriend, who is the executive of Tinder, which I think is uh, pretty hilarious, all, all things to consider there. So, <laughs> yeah, so she's complaining about like the whole celebrity culture and how she can't stand the paparazzi, <laughs> how it's a little too much. But you go from, from L.A. to New York, like you literally just went from one extreme to another. New York really isn't that much better. The only difference is that you know, the paparazzi don't get in their cars and like chase you down the street like they do in Los Angeles, but they're, they're still out there in, in New York City. Like, how did you get that so, any, any thoughts on, on, on that? <laughs> any thoughts on that? <laughs> she uh, she can live wherever she wants. She's she looks she's perfect looking. Oh my god, oh, he's so <laughs> Down, so she's a millionaire. I who cares? I don't care where she lives. She's she just has to look nice on screen. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I'm kind of the same way, Retro Rob. I mean, except the looking. I mean, honestly, I, okay, I'm not gonna go there. I, I, yeah, but um. Like you just I mean, ran into like four walls in the course of like 30 seconds. It's too <laughs> common. It's too fucking common. I mean, all all, all it has to like happen this, now. Common. All it has to happen now is that Josh also needs to join in with these three stooges. So they would literally be the simp stooges. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm not, man, not me, man. I, I'm I not conforming to your I love New York City. I love New York City. Okay, despite all the pride, but I mean, I love to visit and eat food. Is really what you know, like you know, it's amazing. And it's hey, day. Broadway's great if, especially if like you, you know, prominent actors if you have money show or whatever. <laughs> the range. Yes, there, exactly. I, I, yeah, you can't go there. Bro. Wait, but hold on, hold on. No, 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 hold on. Before, because somebody is accusing me of being a simp. A simp. Not yet. I'm just, Who? I was yes. asking you to join yeah. in. <laughs> I'm not really taking any stances. I mean, I don't care about Anna de Armas. I don't care about Jamie Lee Curtis. I just don't care about any of them. Mm -hmm. Because I don't I care agree. about anyone really, but still. Yeah. <laughs> you heartless bastard. Now I'm playing. <laughs> I am the heartless, the heartless wanker. <laughs> well, Sarah, well, what is your your thoughts? Hopefully, it's a lot different than these pathetic simps that I allow on the program today. Like, well, <laughs> except for me, though. I just, I just, no, no, no. This way, I, I just think myself. I'm actually got to say he's not uh, that he's like not attracted to that, but 
hey, whatever. Okay, it's a good <clears> thing Anna doesn't have an OnlyFans. I feel like you guys would be even more broke than you are now. So. <laughs> no. Only I have some, some self-respect. I watch X videos for fucking free. I think I'm going to spend my money on everything. You're nuts. <laughs> Bro, I don't know how people can do that. Well, I mean, if you... If, uh, Bring I internet to more. Too. Anna's next movie is supposed to be that uh, Netflix movie that's like NC-17, so I mean, you're going to get your wish here. That I want to see. Blonde, yeah, I want to see. I'm not interested. Again, I'm Andrew, still, yeah, three years old, Andrew right? Dominic directed it, and he's done two of my favorite movies of the last 15 or so years. Uh, Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford and um, Killing Them Softly. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that movie. I know it's new material, um, but I think she's going to do great as Marilyn Monroe, so I'm looking forward to it. Like, bro, bro, Rob, Matt, respect, because at least you're, like, you know... Oh, God, I forgot what I was going to say. Whatever. I mean, I know about <laughs> movies. I know what's yeah, coming talk, down the line. That's the thing. I mean, you're, you're women justifying friends. your simping, so it's it's all right. Even if yeah. it's not simping, maybe you're justifying it as well. We you talk know. about attractive women for a couple of minutes, and everyone forgets how to speak. It's just sad. It's just well, sad. did I say that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think Tessa right. Thompson's attractive. I think Dakota Johnson's attractive, and they both say stupid things all the time. So, I Dakota I understand Johnson. the difference between oh, being yeah. attracted to someone well, and liking they both do, what they project. they both do stupid things too. Especially uh, Tessa <laughs> Thompson, who's doing David Cohen. So there you go. There. Is <laughs> I don't she? know who those people are. I'll take your word for it. All right, then. Well, we kind of went completely off the rails there on that last topic. That was that's right. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Spencer, Spencer's probably going like, yes, you see? that. We yeah, don't let, let's just blame Spencer. Crap. Like, this is clearly all his fault, right? So we're all yeah, in right. agreement that this is going to blame Spencer for this. It's all everyone's fault. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so well, we're at the end point here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give everyone a chance to promote their stuff. I got a couple of announcements <clears throat> to make because I kind of made a goof about our uh, filming schedule coming up. So I got to make a couple of corrections there. But since Sarah was our first time guest and where she joined us here this week, I want to give her a chance to kind of promote what she wants to promote. So I know you have a site. I know you you occasionally use Twitter, but you're not very proud of it. So anything you want the people to know, where can they find more of Sarah Hargett in the future? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at H-T-W-A-M underscore Sarah. I'm not on there like right now a lot, but I'll probably come back a little bit. I'm working on a a play right now and so after august i'll probably be back on i'm just a little busy right now and my uh movie review blog is how to watch a motion picture dot blogspot.com all right so i said one of i'm also on letterboxd that's where i'm most active right now letterboxd Oh yeah, I, I've been on there too. Not not too active, but I have posted a lot more uh, reviews there. So yeah, 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 yeah. it's on best to stay off there. Yeah, they they've banned and censored me a couple of times. They, so yeah, I wouldn't they recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kathy, where can they find more of you if they want more cold cast of cage? All right, so uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. Uh, Follow me on Twitch or Twitter, Cult Classic Cage for all three. Fairly simple. Uh, I love to talk about video games. I'm thinking about making a video basically trashing Rob Zombie for ruining my childhood yet again by doing the <laughs> monsters. By doing the monsters and yeah. uh, fuck him for thinking that his <laughs> own wife can live up to Yvonne DiCarlo of all people. One of my Sherry. favorite actresses back in the day. Yeah complete yeah. utter trash it's it's like sizzling in my body and it's like i wanted to avoid making a video but at this point i just the more i think about it the more angry i'm getting so i might do a video on that but i love to talk about video games and uh films or tv shows whatever so if you're into what i'm into come hang with me well if you guys want to hate yourself you should also check out that netflix uh, resident evil series as well just don't oh there. gosh nah, yes. i'm not good about it lance Ralph, TW, what nice do you got coming in Ooh, okay, yeah, you can find me on YouTube, you can find me on Twitch, uh, you can also find me on Odyssey, uh, but yeah, basically on my YouTube and Odyssey, I like to talk about things like music, video games, uh, just most specific entertainment stuff, um, I'm going to be making videos, uh, putting them out tomorrow, uh, or yeah, just coming up, going to be on uh the pantera reunion supposedly pantera reunion um and also for all you mouth breathers out there you mouth breather wrestling fans 
I'm going to be making wrestling <laughs> content, supposedly, uh, uh, again, because I'm going to be talking about Raw going back to TV 14. So, yeah, there you go for all you freaking mouth breathers see, out there. This, okay, there's a timeout here. This is, this is the second week in a row you've done this, so I have to promote your show for you because apparently you're not good at doing it yourself. Next Tuesday <laughs> night, it's 60s night on Twitch. <laughs> Uh, whatever. <laughs> you can do that if you want. It's sixties night. It forgets the sixties exist, bro. It's, oh, it's your it. channel. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> well, real shit. Uh, but but yeah, uh, yeah. Tuesday we'll be uh, listening to some sixties music, jamming into sixties shit, uh, and also one more announcement. Uh, I'm cutting these bullshits off. I'm tired of it. So yeah, oh, uh, next dang. time you uh, uh see me, it won't be with this these dreads. No, 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 hold on, on a second. I'll grow them back. But... <laughs> are you going like full bald, or are you going like ludicrous in two thousand six? Ludicrous two thousand six. <laughs> okay, then, that's probably yeah, a nice decision. More like that. I'm I'm gonna probably go full bald when I get a little bit older, so maybe I can look like Keegan Michael Key. Yeah, <laughs> I want to go, go for that. You go full ball when there's basically nothing left, like like me. Yeah, so, exactly. When there's nothing left, then you just shave your whole off. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that I'm not looking like no George Costanza or nothing like that or <laughs> Sherman. <laughs> like, nah. Nah. Don't, don't, don't walk, walk around. Do, do not walk around with a George Jefferson. Do not do yeah, that. Yeah, I was just about to say that, too. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, that's never happening. They're like, nah. I, I'll, I'll go completely hairless the minute with that shit. Yeah. yeah. All right, then, Rob, where can they find more of Rob Models movies? Just go to my Twitter. No. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> for me. Just, just me on my Twitter. Um, yeah, I talk about movies a lot. I You will we'll frequently disagree with what I say. Um, that's the whole fun of it. And just follow me. I like to start shit. Uh, and talk about movies. That's about it. Yep. All right. And what about the, the site? Is there any progress on on the site yet, or no? I'm a, have an actual site. Just... No, yeah, I'm 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 working on um, stopping smoking weed all the time, so that'll, that'll help <laughs> me get to write more uh, movie reviews. So mm -hmm. uh, those are coming down the pike. When I don't know, because I'm kind of getting my life together right now. I need to find a job too. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I understand, man. And then, of course, we have the critical drinker. Josh, how you that's doing? Where can they find you, Josh? I, I can't. Oh, I can't use that because that's register, isn't it? No, the critical mm -hmm. drinker. The I'm, condescending I'm just, drinker. The condescending just, drinker. Just, there you go. I'm just a wasted drinker, man. <laughs> I just drink and I get wasted. I said, oh, mm -hmm. we, we call it in England, we just get waste, well, wasted. Wanker? Yeah. I don't know. It kind of sounds yeah, that's, that's the problem. Like, you, you English people drink so much. Like, when are you ever going to know if you actually have a problem or not? Oh, you never have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you just never have a problem. That's the, that's the yeah. beauty of it as well, right? So just don't, don't really. Mm -hmm. No, we don't really have those kind of issues. First world issues or whatever. First, second, third world issues. Wonka says Spencer on the comments. Smog wee says Louis the Casual. Mm -hmm. as well. Um. Right. So where can you find me? You can find me at Bounding Into Comics, writing some juicy articles every now and then. You can also find me at Bounding Into Sports. I wrote my second article today, so I'm really pleased with that as well. One of the reasons why I'm wearing this, I got three reasons now, though. So Bounding Into Sports, <laughs> uh, calling out Spencer as well, because this is actually the most English item I own at the moment, because I don't have a flag and just whatever. That's a good thing. And the third reason I can't really remember because I'm drunk. So, <laughs> so you can you can find me in those places. Maybe you can go to Twitter and follow me at oh gosh, I can never remember what the what the tag is. Um, so something like average, average Josh. Yeah, but I can't remember if it's the average George, which is the average George 1983. Yeah. yeah, see, that's why I just keep it simple because I am too, I too much mess up numbers and letters and all. That you keep stuff. it simple every time. Every time you do this thing for yourself, you take like two minutes to talk about your stuff. Come on, yeah. Man. I go, uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Give, I'm give, sorry. I'm sorry. Have things going on what's, in my what's life. A, what's oh, the time? Yeah. What's the time? Man? The what, reason what why the you time, think man? it's only two minutes is because you passed out two minutes in. Yeah. I probably yes, it's probably five minutes. 
Thank you. All right. It's probably five minutes of Jacob saying that. Well, so you can find me at Burning Into Comics, Burning Into Sports. And well, that's what I've got because I haven't started making my videos because my microphone is crap. It's not crap, but the rest of the thing about the microphone is crap because I broke yeah. the stand thingy, whatever. Oh, I just broke it. Like it was brand new and I broke it. You, you didn't try to like. I wasn't drunk. Stand. I was sober when I broke it, by the way. So, okay, um, just make sure. I'll uh, try to make sure you didn't get like in a drunk fight with like your microphone. Yeah. And, right. oi, oi, oi. Spotlight. Uh, okay, let's go here. And, um, come on, man. I would be watching the movie with you guys if you do. What movie is it that I'm going to mention? Well, if you let me get to what I was going to say, I was going to tell you what that movie was going <laughs> to oh, be. Oh, gosh. Is, is it going to be the one on one? Finally. Yeah. Oh, yes. great, 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 Rob great Mello, thank you. Great, great payoff there, Josh. So thanks. Okay. Let me, let me steer this show <laughs> back on its rails for a little bit here. Um, so just to let you guys know what's coming up uh, the next couple of, uh, I guess, next week or so. So um, tomorrow night, we're going to be on Twitch, Twitch exclusive. We're going to be watching the film Roadhouse. It's going to be an exclusive film only on Twitch. Roadhouse. I can tell you this right now that uh, we'll definitely be uh, seeing this a lot uh, during the film. <laughs> not, not too much, but there are a scene here and there, so I'm definitely going to be getting my workout done. <laughs> so Roadhouse will be the film to watch tomorrow night. Also, Monday. So here's the thing that's going on Monday. We were supposed to be reviewing uh, The Gray Man, which just comes out on Netflix with Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans. Apparently, they're not actually uh, releasing that film until next week. So because the movie's only been in like a limited amount of cities, what we're going to do is that we're going to push that uh, review back to next week. So in two weeks, we're going to be reviewing both uh, Jordan Peele movie Nope and The Gray Man. And we're also going to have our good friend Christian Toto, who's going to be joining us for the first time, who is going to be reviewing both of those movies with us. And then hopefully uh, Matt from all the way in Australia is going to be uh, back with us in two weeks as well so that's what we're going to do so this monday there will be a stream on uh, monday night same time except for monday instead of doing a movie review we're going to be doing a second movie night so we're going to be doing two movie nights in, in three days oh, wow. so uh if you join us tomorrow night at the end of the show we'll figure out what movie we're going to be watching on monday night so yeah we're going to do a movie night um wednesday i'll be back with uh bounding in the comments the black hill stream myself john trent Spencer, maybe he's somewhere taking vitamin D and preferably showing up, so he'll be better. So he'll be ready to go on Wednesday night. And then Josh will obviously be with us as well. Maybe you'll see Cassie. Maybe you'll see Rob. I'll just, we don't know what's going to happen there, but you know, there's going to be some good things going on there. And then, of course, next week we'll be right here on um, for episode eight of the Barroom Podcast as well. And while I have the spotlight, I guess we should just kind of go ahead and ask uh, one more question here. It's that uh, Sarah... Obviously, you've done a lot of movie reviews, and we all like Sarah. Everyone likes Sarah, right? Everyone gives Sarah a round yeah, of applause. Sarah's awesome. Yeah, I was just about to say, technically, just, no, all right, do some subs as well. So we know you're busy right now, but we do want to have you on on the movie review stream, too. We want to have you back here uh, every now and then, too. So can we bully you into uh, reviewing movies on a consistent basis with the rest of us? It depends on what movie it is, because I have not gone to the theater in a long time. Well, I went to see Top Gun, but I'm like, yeah, you know, not going to the theater a lot right now. So it's going to be have to be a movie that I want to see or something that's streaming. But yeah, um, fully away. Well, we'll get some streaming movies. So, I mean, come on. It's like, well, we sit here and suffer through all the bad movies you can't suffer through. <laughs> you, can't, you can't take one for the team and, and watch <laughs> well, like a really no. crappy movie. I would if it was free. <laughs> no, okay. Oh, no. It's probably the Resident Evil show, the new Resident Evil show. That's yeah, what it is. Well, I did say this. I no said bullying this me into Netflix Rob. movies. <laughs> oh, 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 all right. So it's, well, it's, I, I didn't have this movie. What the limits of the of the contract are? <laughs> I, I will say this. There, there's a um, uh, was it Billy Eilner? His movie Bros, which is coming out, which is supposed to be like an all LGBTQ movie, uh, a, ro a, ro a romantic comedy movie featuring all gay and trans people that comes out in a couple of months. That <laughs> might be the first. Uh, Society Reviews Beer Night stream because I don't think that any of us are going to be able to get through that without having at least a couple of beers, maybe other drinks. In our, in our Hold system, on. So. Oh, movie stream because the, the other one was like fight, right? So it's not yeah, yeah. a movie. It was the, the other one was anyway. actually fun, whereas that sounds like pain and suffering. And <laughs> I might be able to get through it sober because I don't want to drink no beer. That's just nasty. 
Uh, I, I do want to. Well, no, we're talking about the actual like movie review movie. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, gotcha. Oh, I was just gonna say that like I did a uh, I did a Oscars drunk stream this past year. Yeah. I think that if if people are interested in doing that, I would be I would be interested in that you know next year because that award show is just so mind-numbingly dull. You need to have at least something to to sip on. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how you could sit through it. Jeez. It, 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 it's gonna be a rough summer. It, it's gonna be a pretty, pretty uh, rough summer. I'm just gonna throw that out there. But for everyone who joined us tonight, uh, Osnot, thanks for joining us. Louis the Casual joining us once again. Spencer, like I said, take some vitamin D, get better, shut up, yep. stuff like that. Feel better, buddy. Uh, yeah, he, he's still going through it, but you know, we wish him the good best of luck. But okay. until then, that's everything that's going on. Oh, by the way, uh, Society Movies on uh, Twitter. If you want to follow my high takes. Otherwise, just follow me here on the YouTube channel, on the Twitch channel, if you're following us there as well. So for everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, you guys here in the panel, stick around. I want to talk to you guys once we go uh, off air. But for everyone else who is watching us, I just wanted to go ahead and send you guys off. Thanks for joining us for another week. It's been a very, very fun show, uh, especially this one's probably a little bit more fun than others because we completely lost control in the last 30 minutes. But outside of that, <laughs> we'll, see you, we'll see you tomorrow night on Twitch when we watch Roadhouse. So Making Spencer proud. Yeah, exactly. Kids, 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 to the rap music. Kids, 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 to the rap music. What do you like to play? Pokemon. 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 What do you like to play? Pokemon. 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 You see, the kids, they listen to the rap, which gives them the brain damage. You see, with their hippin' and the hoppin' and the pippin' and the boppin', so they don't know what the jazz is all about. You see, jazz is like yellow pudding. No, actually, it's more like Kodak film. No, actually, jazz is like a new coat. It'll be around forever. <laughs> What's the difference between me and you? Little fella, you like a jump rope? What do you think candy is made out of? Pokemon! Pokemon? No! Actually, candy is more like Kodak film. See? Here I go, down the slope. Oh, I'm going zip zop zoom at the bottom. It's okay, take your time. Do you remember what he looked like? I had an uncle named Stewie, and he used to sell bicycles. Now, you, you, what you got there? Oh, 